Always. Even when you let yourself get comfortable in life, there's always another one lurking in the shadows. No matter what we may accomplish, the powerful friends we grow closer to, or even the wealth we may accumulate, there's always another damn bully just waiting for the opportunity to remind us of how small and worthless we are. The events at the old mill introduced me to far greater threats than I ever could have imagined, but I had no idea how deep the scar tissue had festered. The time I spent with my parents, a Jensen Orchid and all of his high-priced goons, and even the devil himself, could never have prepared me for what was still to come. Perhaps those two years of stress-free living allowed me the briefest of moments to think I had escaped all of the torments life had in store for me. Unfortunately, it would seem it was little more than the calm before the storm. I hadn't told Brandon the entire truth of what happened that night, given the revelations of who my closest and dearest friend was all along, I don't think that would make for an easy discussion. How he awoke with no bullets buried in his chest cavity, along with his regrown fingers, I just chalked it up to us having been drugged by the head of Orchid Industries. It wasn't the most well-thought-out pile of bullshit to account for the insanity that night, but our tax-free prize was enough to distract him from seeking out the actual truth. I'm sure he had his suspicions, but he never pushed it any further. As for Grant's disappearance, I had to get a little more inventive on that one, explaining that our mutual friendship had been an undercover operation the whole time. I claimed he had been investigating the corruption of the company for some time, ultimately leading him to spend years on the job. Uh, given the nature of his work, he could neither stick around when the dust cleared, nor enjoy a share of our winnings, as he couldn't risk exposure for further assignments. I was positive he didn't buy any of that for a minute, but he went along with it either way. When Brandon met Ashley, he grew far more at peace than I had ever known him to be. Yes, he attended regular therapy as he was still haunted by that week, along with some rough times in his youth he had never quite been able to get over, but he was content. I tried talking to a shrink myself once, but it wasn't for me. Maybe I'm simply not the best at talking things out, or perhaps I just prefer to write it all down before I decide if there's the remotest chance my thoughts are even rational. Who knows? Regardless of what brought us to where we had arrived in life, we were happy, it's something neither of us expected when we were younger. Even Ash had grown to feel like a sister to me, especially since she spent just about every day at the house since around the second week of she and Brandon becoming an official couple. They weren't married yet, but I had overheard a conversation or two. Of course, I didn't let on that I thought they may be rushing things a bit, uh, having only been together for a few months, but it wasn't my business. Plus, I didn't want them to be thinking I'd been snooping or anything. I loved Brandon like a brother, which not only made me feel worse about lying to him, but caused the impact of what came next to leave yet another deep and gnarly scar across my already tarnished subconscious. I'm getting ahead of myself. Apologies for that. A lot has happened since we last spoke, so to speak. I suppose I'm still dealing with a lot of it, but all may not be lost just yet. Or so I'm hoping, anyway. It wasn't Grant's arrival that night that caused things to go sideways, but it was most certainly a factor. God knows, uh, pardon the expression, that I was absolutely thrilled to see my dearest friend again, but I wish I'd listened to his recommendation that we just meet at a neutral location before heading on that road trip. It was my fault that I convinced him to come to the house. I suppose I wanted him to see the fruits of our labor in that maddening place, along with seeing my closest friends together again. I should have just listened to him in the first place, but I don't think either of us was prepared for what lay ahead. After some back and forth, we agreed to meet at the house around eight. I had already packed up everything I hoped I would need for the time away, though I wasn't entirely sure how long we'd be gone, nor did I have any clue where we were headed. Either way, I had the Bronco loaded up with at least a good week's worth of supplies, so I had no responsibilities left for the day until Grant would arrive later that night. I was especially anxious, 
both in anticipation of seeing my friend as well as where our quest would lead us, so I decided to swing by the bar to kill some time. It was only four in the afternoon, but Brandon was already up on the small platform we called a stage, playing his guitar and singing directly to Ash, regardless of how many other patrons were enjoying the show. I just sat on one of the bar stools and leaned back, nursing a wonderfully chilled beer while admiring the skillful strumming of my friend and business partner. As I stared off, daydreaming with the soothing musical score in the background, I became aware that someone was watching me. My eyes blinked back to reality to meet those of a gorgeous brunette at the back of the bar. She just stood there in a slinky red dress, gazing at me while sipping from her glass. As her lips formed a slight half-smile, I suddenly felt inspired to approach her. I turned to the counter to set my drink down, but when I spun back around, she was gone. I looked around to seek her out, but there was absolutely no trace of the beautiful woman with the silky, dark hair. Shrugging off my momentary distraction, I turned my attention back to my drink and got back to allowing my mind to wander some more. Not half bad, is he? A familiar voice spoke from beside me, snapping me back to the real world once more. Holy shit, I said, immediately wrapping my arms around my old friend. An equally as enthusiastic... Holy shit, called out from the stage, amplified by the microphone Brandon had been reciting the lyrics to Sweet Child of Mine into, accompanied by the sound of his guitar practically being dropped to the floor. Before I knew it, the three of us were huddled up at the bar in some awkward manner of a group hug. I hadn't even told Brandon that Grant was going to be in town, only that I was planning a small get-together at the house later. Even after I released my arms from around my old mate, Brandon still gripped him tightly. Given that the two hadn't seen each other since that crazy week came to its bloody conclusion, I couldn't blame him for the enthusiasm. You must be the infamous Grant, Ash said with a chuckle after she wandered over. How'd you know? Brandon asked, finally ending his embrace. Well, I guess the ponytail sort of gave it away, she replied still giggling softly. Grant put his best humble gentleman routine, bowing his head at her, before lifting her hand to his mouth, giving it a small peck on his lips. We all laughed at his attempts to come off all dignified and such, but I couldn't help but notice Ashley's cheeks reddened a bit. For the next few hours, we drank, smoked, and laughed, and not unlike those brief moments of joy over our week away from life as we knew it, at the expense of Orchid Industries. It felt so good to catch up, though Grant couldn't exactly divulge too much of his day-to-day -day life over the past two years, especially around Brandon and Ash. After a while, we headed back to the house, from where my friend and I planned to leave out early the following morning. Given that my head was already swimmy from alcohol, I was thinking it may not be quite as early as we had previously discussed after all. A bloody nice place you got here, boys. He said, after taking the tour. Not too shabby, right? It wasn't until we gathered in the quite sizable living room while discussing whether or not we wanted to take some drinks out to the pool or to the beach that Ashley interrupted out of the blue. Now that I have you all here, I have an announcement to make. She was smiling while she spoke, but something had changed in her eyes that I couldn't quite put my finger on at the time. Grant and I looked at each other, and I assumed that we were on the same page, that she may be about to reveal that she and Brandon were engaged, but when I turned to him, he looked a bit confused himself, and even a little unsettled. I thought I may have been reading entirely too much into things, but when she spoke again, I couldn't think of a single word to respond. It's time for you all to come home. I... Uh, we are home, babe. Brandon said, glancing back at Grant and me as if to reassure himself. This isn't where you belong, she said, as the lights began to flicker. Not anymore. Ash, what are you talking about? I didn't have a chance to finish my question before the ground started shuddering, tipping lamps to the ground while causing picture frames to fall. You 
belong with me. Her eyes darkened to a glossy black, the same color the walls had begun to bleed. The entire house was quaking while the room transformed before my eyes. As Ashley's skin paled, darkened veins lined behind her almost translucent flesh, each visibly throbbing, while her voice deepened to something hauntingly foreign from who I had thought her to be. Even the tattoos across her arms and chest appeared to be morphing into something else. It's time to come home now. As the walls completed their transition to the same pulsating glossy black that lined the halls and rooms of the building we almost lost our lives in, I could feel the voice, not only from the now barely recognizable girl who had spent the last months in our company, but calling out from within me as well. Michael, Grant shouted. Brandon, we have to get out of here. I could barely make out any words above the shuddering of the entire house, which now sprouted a seamlessly endless stairway to the rear end of the living room as the ceiling skyrocketed upwards and out of view. Come with me. Come back to me. She outstretched her hands, cutting her blackened eyes between each of us, one by one. Back home. Back where you belong. Brandon almost seemed in a trance as he paced towards her, reaching his hand out as he neared. Brandon, no! I grabbed him by the shoulder, but I couldn't so much as to cause him to hesitate. Even when Grant reached for him, he would not stop placing one foot in front of the next. Back home, he said, almost breathing the words, barely more than a whisper. Damn it, Brandon, snap out of it! Grant and I both practically tackled him, but we couldn't so much as force him to miss a single step. We both skidded our feet against the floor, attempting to pull him back, but this only served to drag us closer along with him. Don't be afraid. Just come home. As soon as Brandon's fingers intertwined with those of what used to be his girlfriend, he took his place beside her, his own eyes mimicking her empty stare. Come home, Michael. Both voices spoke, now echoing their haunting tone. Come home, Grant. They each outstretched their hands towards us as I fought to not be pulled in like Brandon had. We have to go, mate, Grant said, grabbing me by the arm. We can't leave him like this, I said, feeling my heart race with pure and exhilarated panic. He's already gone. We can. I won't fucking leave him. I screamed, turning to meet the gaze of my friend. He grabbed me by the shoulders, staring deep into my eyes. I tried to turn to face the approaching husks of what were once two of my dearest friends, but Grant screamed my name once more, pulling my attention back to him. If we don't leave now, they'll pull us back with them. The horrendously vibrating floor and walls were beginning to make me feel queasy. That, along with the haunting twin voices calling out from somewhere beyond my subconscious. We can't help them if we're dragged back in there too, Grant said with frenzied panic in his voice. I could feel the outstretched arms drawing closer as the words that echoed through my mind and body began to seduce me. Michael. I heard from somewhere in the distance. Michael, we have to go now. The voice was further away now, somewhere beyond the reach of the only words that mattered. I had to go home. Michael, wake the fuck up. I felt a sting on the side of my face. Where did that come from? I thought, as I began to pace towards those who had returned me to where I belonged. That's right. There's nothing to fear. Come home, Michael. Damn it, you bloody wanker. Snap the fuck out of it. Another sharp pain, far more intense than the last. The other voice was getting closer again. I knew that voice. Grant. That was Grant. My friend. I felt my mind escaping the clutches of those droning and haunting tones. 
my eyes regained their focus on the two blank and sunken faces only feet from where I stood, dropping my arm back to my side. You with me, mate? He was panting, with sweat practically pouring from his brow. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you, man. He gave me a nod before outstretching his hand, not towards those who still edged closer by the second, but in the direction of where I thought the front door to my house to have once been located. The glossy black wall violently shuddered, far more aggressively than the others that lined the room, which appeared to be growing more monstrous with every passing moment. No. The twin voices screamed in a shrill unison, practically causing nausea I had been experiencing to drop me to the trembling floor. Grant grabbed me by my shirt, pulling me away from the two who quickens their pace towards us while cracks formed across the violently shuddering wall. As I looked back at Brandon one last time, practically begging him to break free of this maddening spell, an explosion forced my attention back to where my other friends stood now pulling me in the direction of the fresh opening to the outside world. But, Brandon... We can get him back, mate. I... I hope we can, anyway. We ran side by side to the midnight blue Bronco, while I dug around in my pocket, praying it still held my keys within. We can't just leave him like this, I said, feeling my heart skip when I wrapped my fingers around the keychain. We can't help him if we're stuck in there too, mate. As we climbed into the large SUV, I cranked the engine, flipped the shifter into reverse, and reluctantly pressed the pedal down. When I slammed on the gas, spinning free from the lengthy driveway while pointing the hood in the direction of the open road ahead, I took one last glance back at the house I shared with my friend and business partner. Even its exterior looked like a shrunken carbon copy of that enormous and horrifying building I still see in my nightmares. The gargoyles perched upon the roof almost appeared to be gazing right into my own quivering eyes. I watched Brandon and Ash strolling hand in hand through the opening Grant had made to allow us to escape. They each held one arm out while they echoed their deepened and haunting words. Please, come home, Michael. I couldn't deny there was a part of me that almost begged me to return, pleading for me to allow them to lead me back home. Before giving them a second opportunity to pull me back in, I once more forced the accelerator pedal to the floor, speeding away from the house I once shared with a dear friend, someone I swore I would find a way to rescue. For the next hour or so, neither Grant nor I spoke a single word to one another. I couldn't speak for my friend, but I, for one, couldn't even think of anything to say. I had no idea what direction we were headed, nor if I was even going the right way at the time, but the radio was still cranked high from the last time I was in the car. I was happy for the distraction even if my ears were still ringing from the events I would have never escaped without Grant's intervention. It almost got me too, mate. I glanced over to the passenger seat, both surprised by his words and curious at the same time. I could hear them in my head, and... bugger me, mate. I almost gave in to it myself. Seriously? Not only did my knowledge of who and what Grant truly was made me assume he would be immune to what caused me to lose my senses, but his words made me even more intimidated by it. I think we may have left a piece of ourselves in that place. It's powerful, mate. Far more so than I. But uh, what you did... I mean, you opened a door to hell in that place. If it was so powerful, uh, how could... That wasn't the building itself. I think it was some sort of... I don't know. Maybe a sort of waiting room or something that connects it directly to this world. When we were in the heart of that ruddy place, I was powerless. Wasn't until we crossed into the hallway I felt it coming back. Even back at your place, took everything I had to blow that wall out. Wait. So, when we were all beat to shit, you were... 
Just a man. Yeah. It stripped me down. Scared the shit out of me, too. I laughed. I wasn't sure what inspired me to give that particular reaction to this revelation, but it seems to fit the madness of it all. Grant gave me a slightly annoyed look before he cracked up, too. So you were pretending to be just an average asshole that whole time, I said, still gasping for breath between belly laughs. And that bitch turned you into one. Isn't that ironic? Don't you think? Grant replied, wiping tears from his eyes in between chuckles. It was most certainly a strange topic to have inspired such random levity to an otherwise painful and brutal night, but it finally allowed me to begin to accept what happened and attempt to find a way to move on. We'll get him back, mate, he said, after our laughter died down, leaving only the radio keeping the silence at bay. Do you really think we have a chance in hell to pull that off? I don't know, mate, but if a chance in hell is what we need, I got you covered. Cute. I thought so. He chuckled again, inspiring me to join in once more. Once upon a time, I never could have imagined I would find a reason to laugh when faced with such insanity, but I never could have planned for having the devil himself as my closest friend either. Perhaps it was just the fact that I had been through far more than my fair share of extreme situations that allowed me to find my way back from things so traumatic that may have left someone far less experienced in a catatonic state. So, where exactly are we going, anyway? I asked when we settled down for a moment, or borderline losing our damn minds. For tonight, I'm thinking we find a hotel. I don't know about you, but I'm bloody exhausted. Do you, uh, I mean, no offense at all, but do you actually need sleep? It felt strange to ask such a question, especially to someone who I had known to sleep a lot during our time together before I knew the truth. I suppose I hadn't considered these kinds of things, even over the last couple of years, but this was the most substantial time we had spent together since I got to peek behind the curtain. When I'm in this, he said, patting himself on the chest, I require just about everything a human body needs, if that makes sense. He spoke almost nonchalantly, as though this was a perfectly average conversation. So, uh, um, that's not you. I mean, I'm not necessarily looking at, like, the real you right now. Mate, this is me. He held his hand to his heart again. I think of this like nothing more than a change of clothes, in a way. So, are you, I, I don't know, like, possessing someone right now? I chuckled at the question, but it was more from how awkward it felt than from actually being funny. It's not like that, he laughed, far more genuinely than I. This is sort of a empty husk, for lack of a better term. I step inside and I'm Grant, but I'm also, well, me. So, do you have, like, a closet of Grant suits? My chuckle was far more real this time. Oh yeah, just like my day of the week undies. We were still laughing while I drifted onto the nearest exit in search of a hotel for the night. Within minutes, we were driving alongside everything from roadside motels to far more classy, multi-level hotels. After arranging two rooms for the nights at one of the more fancy locations, I gave my friend one last hug before turning to my room across the hall from his. I've missed the hell out of you, man, I said. It had been a rough couple of days, and I was still terrified of what lay ahead, as well as whether or not we would be able to bring Brandon back. Still, it felt good to have Grant by my side again. Yes, between Orchid Senior and whatever Ashley had become, we had our work cut out for us, but I hoped we could pull it off. Yeah, mate, you too, he replied before walking through his door. As soon as I let myself fall upon the plush mattress, I realized how exhausted I was, both mentally and physically. I allowed the weight of potentially losing Brandon to consume me for a moment. I attempted to keep the moans that accompanied the tears silent when I let them loose, 
but once they kicked in, I couldn't even hope to contain them. I pounded my fists against the soft mattress while trying my hardest not to scream out from the pain in my chest. After some time, I managed to convince myself to settle back down, but I would not accept this loss. Not without a fight. Even if the powers behind that building could strip Grant of his gift, I still had faith that we could find a way to bring our friend home. With that very conviction in the back of my mind, I allowed the throbbing in my chest to dissipate. What tomorrow may hold? Well, surely it couldn't be any worse than what this day had presented us with. That was my hope, anyway. Of course, things are never that simple. The chaos of the previous day's events was still fresh in my mind when I finally opened my eyes the following early afternoon. I had grown so content with my life that I had almost forgotten how much these things can take their toll. My heart throbbed with the fear of whether or not we would be able to bring our friends home, and I felt little drive to pull myself free from the comfortable hotel bed. Still, I knew that my only chance in finding some semblance of hope would be to put on a brave face and deal with whatever came next. I headed over to Grant's room after taking a quick shower and getting dressed. When I knocked on his door off and on for a few minutes to receive no answer, I just shrugged it off and returned to my room. I had no way of knowing if he had headed out for a bit, or if he may have still been sleeping. I still wasn't entirely sure what sort of maintenance his husk required, but that was the least crucial of the many questions I hoped to be able to ask him someday. I ordered some room service lunch while I lounged around my temporary living quarters for a bit. I was still doing my best to force my mind to escape these most recent troubles, as well as those for many years gone by, which still caused me to wake in the middle of the night on occasion. I inspected my luggage and coat after feeling the urge to make sure I hadn't left anything behind before flipping on the TV to distract myself in any way I could. I was still somewhat mentally vacant as I blankly stared at whatever show had attempted to secure my interest when a veritable pounding on the door caused me to snap back to reality. We have to go, Grant said, his face reddening. What? Now, Michael. I started to head back to the bedroom to gather my things, but he just grabbed me by the arm and pulled me towards the elevator in the center of the hallway. As the door closed before my eyes, I saw several men in suits running towards us. What the hell, Grant? I asked, grasping for breath. Safe to say they found us, he replied, panting a little himself. But they just look like men, surely you... As soon as the door reopened, my friends darted through. Hurry, Michael. I raced after him towards the front door of the lobby. Just as we cleared the opening, I heard voices shouting at us. I turned to see the six bulky men in black suits, wearing sunglasses and leather gloves, each reaching into their jackets, likely to draw their weapons. Each of the men were quite large, but I was sure I could handle at least one or two of them. Of course, I was certain Grant could take all of them with one hand tied behind his back. Where are we going? I called out to Grant, who veered away from the parking lot. Just trust me. I heard the scampering men draw closer to my rear, when my friends ducked into an alley to the left, a good distance from the hotel we had spent the night in. As soon as I rounded the corner, I saw Grant had stopped, but still waved me onward. He practically pushed me behind the dumpster behind him, before taking his place back where he stood in the center of the narrow walkway though I assumed his forcing me out of the way was to ensure my safety when our pursuers rounded the corner, I still peered around to see what was happening. Get on your knees, the broad-shouldered guy with the buzz caught in front called out, training his gun on my friend. Bad move, buddy boy, I thought, chuckling to myself as I realized why Grant had led us away from the public. I watched on while my friend placed his hand behind his back, a stance I'd come to see as one that should scare the shit out of those he faced. Though his stature didn't quite have that same intimidation factor as it did when he wore the pinstriped suit, for some reason, he still appeared as one who should not be fucked with, dressed in his blue flannel shirt and holy jeans. How'd you locate us? 
he said to the man, who still yelled for him to drop to the concrete after reverting to what I have grown to call his down-to-business voice. Get down on the ground, asshole, or I'm gonna... The apparent leader of the flock of well-dressed men fell silent to the tune of a quick succession of snapping sounds which echoed against the walls of the slender alley. It was nothing as dramatic as seen in the movies. It wasn't as if his head suddenly spun in place to face those who stood behind him. It was more like his eyes grew wide for a second before life drained from his face, and he just hit the ground. I couldn't honestly say which of his bones broke with the flick of my friend's wrist, but they put an end to the bastard before he could even finish his words. Of course, it may well have been every single bone in his body as he dropped like a sack of jello. Either way, this inspired the almost too predictable actions of the man's associates to open fire on Grant. Once upon a time, this would have terrified me. But now it only brought something of a smile to my face. After each bullet drilled into my friend, he fell motionless to the concrete. I felt my heart skip for a second, but it was swiftly put back to rest when Grant gave me a wink from where he lay, supposedly bleeding to death. Clearly he wanted to blow off some steam and maybe have a little fun with these men. I suppose I couldn't blame him as there's no telling how many innocent lives could have fallen victim to what these individuals had in store for us, had we not fled the bustling hotel. How did he do that, Clint? Is he dead? Where'd the other one go? Go check on that one. Fuck you. You check on him. The two of the five remaining men were erratically talking over each other, and... Even though each of their guns sounded to have some sort of suppressor attached, I was sure that someone outside the alley could have heard the commotion. When I heard the footsteps coming closer to where I still hid, I couldn't help but find my friend's imitation of a dead man to be quite convincing. Still, he deserved to enjoy himself a bit. He'd been looking stressed since he arrived at the bar. As the one who approached nudged Grant with his foot, I almost jumped out of my skin as much as he did when my friend wrapped his fingers around his ankle. As soon as the man aimed his gun at the supposedly deceased man on the ground, Grant just raised straight up to a standing position, like Dracula rising from his coffin, still gripping his assailants by the ankle, before slinging him back towards the others. As I had years before, I watched on while the holes that had riddled my friend's torso sealed themselves back shut, dropping the spent bullets onto the concrete. Before any of his attackers could fire on him again, a wave of his hand caused the guns to smack against the wall, while the men gazed on, with their collective mouths hanging limp. Now, Grant said, still speaking in his upper-class business voice, how did you know where to find us, and how may I locate your employer? His questions were only met with whimpers and begs for mercy, to which he looked somewhat exhausted almost immediately. Please stop that. All I need from you is an answer. Give me that, and I won't hurt you. Please? Several voices said, overlapping one another. Like I said, answers. That's all I... Oh, stop it. Grant's frustration with the five weeping men was only escalating, as they seemed incapable of forming any legible words at the time. It's just... It's just... Let us go... The whining man was silenced when Grant slapped his hands together before swatting his left upwards, raising the quintet from the ground back to a standing position. He outstretched his right hand, instantly causing the closest of the men to quickly float towards my friend, who clutched his fingers around the man's throat when he was close enough. Look, mate, you're gonna give me some bloody answers, or I'm gonna squeeze your neck until your ruddy head pops off. You get me? Even I felt my neck tense up when Grant began to lose his cool. As intimidating as his proper voice sounded, him suddenly returning to a very pissed-off limey with unimaginable power was honestly a little terrifying. I... I, I get you. The trembling man with freshly soiled dress pants stuttered through a shallow breath. Grant released his grip, dropping the man back to his feet, before gesturing for his associates to come closer. 
They each looked at one another before walking forwards on trembling legs, still whimpering slightly, but seemingly attempting to compose themselves. It would appear they were not quite informed about what they would be facing when they were sent out on this little mission. Uh, Orchid, uh, Jeremy Orchid sent us. I know who sent you. What I would like to know is where do I find them? Uh, I, uh, I can't tell you that. And why not? The man was visibly shivering while his associates whimpered the demands that he remain silent. He, 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 he'd kill me, uh, my family, I can't... Were you not charged with taking me to him anyway? We were supposed to... To kill me? The trembling man simply nodded, barely able to control his voice anymore. Grant just stared into his face, not unlike how he did with Chuck back in that ungodly place, what felt like decades ago. I'm sure, uh, by this point, anyway, you know this is something you cannot accomplish, yes? He nodded once more with his lower lip quivering. I imagine it can be taken for granted that those who sent you here knew this as well, yes? Another nod, mimicked by all of the men charged with this ill-fated mission. Grant smiled at the shaking man before waving his hand for the others to come even closer. They reluctantly paced forward again, looking as though they were about to lose control of their senses at any moment. Relax, yeah, Grant said when all had gathered in front of him. You guys are just doing your job. I get that. My friend and I have something of a responsibility to sort this out also. He gestured with his head for the men to follow him as he walked to where their fallen comrade lay. When he crouched down beside the man whose twisted body lay still, he lay a hand on his chest, causing the empty shell to twitch and contort while the sounds of bones snapping back into place echoed across the length of the slender alleyway. I finally climbed up from my hiding spot and walked up to my friend's side just in time to see the stranger open his eyes. He gazed up at Grant, both horrified and somewhat in awe of who he looked upon. When my friend held his hand out towards him, he raised his trembling fingers to meet it. Once he had been helped back to his feet, his companions wore completely dumbstruck looks on their faces, but I couldn't help but smile. Even though I knew what Grant was capable of, I don't think I could ever get used to seeing him in action. Alright, look guys. Your boss sent you on a suicide mission here, he said, cutting his eyes between each of the men who had planned to see us dead. I can't say what his motivations for charging you with this were, but I have to assume he wants me to know where to find him. They all looked at one another, whispering words I couldn't make out, but I felt secure in the knowledge that they weren't about to attempt taking up arms against us again. Not now, not with what they had seen. Ken... Can you protect our families? The man who had once recently rejoined the living asked, still shuddering from head to toe. I can't make promises on that, mate. I'm truly sorry about that. But should I be able to locate Orchid, I'll most certainly make sure he can never bring harm to anyone else, ever again. If I can get to him soon enough, perhaps... Alberson Bridge... The guy who my friend had levitated in his direction said, while his friends appeared somewhat reluctant still. Grant looked almost stunned for a moment, seemingly taken aback by this location. You sure? Yeah, man. I mean, uh, sir, we only met with him on occasion, but we'd always have to walk that damn bridge to get to his house. One of the other guys who had only previously spoken in whispers said, His place is only a few miles past it, upon a hill. You can only get there on foot, Grant said, interrupting the man's words. I know the rules of the place. The group of hired guns talked back and forth with my friend for a few minutes, but they didn't have much more in the way of useful information to offer. Yes, they warned us of the veritable horde of well-armed security guards at Orchid Senior's multi-level mansion located some miles past Albertson, but guns and guards shouldn't be much of a problem for Grant. Still, my pulse quickened at the idea of what else may be waiting for us when we got there. You boys get on home to your families. Get them as far away from all this as you can. 
They all nodded in unison, while a few of them were practically kissing Grant's ass with gratitude for sparing them. These were the times that showed me the true nature of my friends. Likely, these men had done some bad shit in their lives, but Grant was letting them go. As they turned to run out of the alley, leaving their guns scattered across the concrete, my friend called out to them one last time. Hey! The men spun in place, each looking downright terrified they had not yet escaped with their lives. Make better choices, yeah? If you don't, we'll most certainly meet again. Next time, I may not be so forgiven. He gave them a childlike grin with a wink before they ran off. I hoped they would take this rare opportunity to forge a more honest life for themselves. It's not every day the devil gives someone a second chance. Once we were alone in the alley, Grant grabbed the guns and threw them in the dumpster I had hidden behind. He shuffled a couple of trash bags around to conceal the weapons beneath, but he still looked mentally checked out while he worked. Once that was done, he just nodded his head for me to follow him. We grabbed anything he had left in the hotel room, loaded up the Bronco, and hit the road once more, still without speaking a word. I can't ask you to come with me on this, mate, he said, after a good half an hour of being back on the interstate. You don't have to ask, man, I replied with a half-smile. That's the thing, mate. I can't ask, as in I won't ask. I just cut my eyes at him before turning back on the road, feeling somewhat confused at what he was getting at. It's far too dangerous, he said. I can't guarantee your safety on this one. I don't even know if... Grant, I said, still keeping my eyes ahead. For one, until we get this shit sorted out, I got nowhere else to go. Two, I'm not leaving, not to let you head into this alone. But I'm... I know what you are. I know who you are. But I know what else you are, too. And what's that? My friend. My brother. You're not alone in this, mate. I gave him a mischievous smile, knowing full well my ability to pull off mate in a sentence had not improved since our last meeting. He just chuckled, shaking his head from side to side. His stubborn bloody wanker. Ew, I replied. Bloody wanker. That's gross. Having finally convinced my friends that I had no intention of allowing him to face whatever had him so rattled alone, he requested that I head to the nearest city. The fact that he didn't care which one we were closest to led me to fear that he may still be attempting to ditch me before taking off on his own, leaving me no clue as to where he was headed. As it turned out, that was not his plan at all. When I pulled on to the exits to downtown Atlanta, Grant directed me this way and that, Left here, right there, carry on for a few miles, and turn again. Were it not for his navigation, I would have been so lost that I'd perhaps never find my way back to the interstate, not without having to refuel an extra time or two. I hadn't always been the most well-traveled individual, having spent close to a decade behind bars, as well as those couple of blissful years by the beach, so I wasn't familiar with this city in the least. When I was finally directed to pull into the lone vacant parking spot in front of what looked to be a long-since-abandoned bar on a street corner, I couldn't help but wonder why this was to be our destination. Another individual aspect of this whole scenario was that every other parking space along this particular stretch of road had a vehicle of one kind or another between its twin white lines. Yes, this tavern looked as though it closed its doors some years ago, but I still couldn't rationalize why nobody may have chosen to at least take the spot in front of it. Grant didn't even have to unlock the door to the old building. He just strolled on in like he owned the joint. Of course, it would seem, that was precisely the case. When I walked in, I didn't look upon an ancient and forgotten place covered with cobwebs and dust, but a very nice-looking, albeit quite small, corner bar. There were stools at the counter, a handful of tables with tall chairs propped at their sides, and even fully operational neon signs bearing the name of one brand of alcohol or another. Be right back. Got to change into some less bullet-ridden clothes, he said, pushing his way through a door behind the counter. After a few moments, he returned, wearing a Pink Floyd t-shirt and some khaki cargo shorts. He leaned down behind the bar, fished a couple of glasses from underneath, and placed them on the counter, 
along with an ashtray, before pouring us each a pint. When he lit up a cigarette, it finally hit me that I hadn't smoked even once since I got out of bed that morning, a situation that I felt inspired to remedy as soon as my friend lit one up for himself. I sat upon the surprisingly comfortable bar stool, took a swig from my fresh pint, and deeply inhaled from my cigarette. I was still somewhat perplexed by this strange little place, but there was something so warm and inviting about it. Though it had looked ancient and somewhat run down from the outside, the beer tasted both fresh and chilled. It was damn refreshing, too. Grant chugged down about a half of a glass before planting his ass on the stool behind the bar. I was still gazing around the room, puffing away in between lining my upper lip with a foamy beer mustache, wiping it off with the back of my hand, and repeating the process once again. Yes, I was pretty confused about both the bar I inhabited with my best friend, as well as the lingering question of what the hell Alberson Bridge had to do with the price of free beer. Not to mention I was still concerned about what happened to Brandon after leaving our home at the beach in the dust but my mind couldn't figure out the best place to start on any of this. Fortunately, Grant was one step ahead, as usual, it would seem. I used to do business here. Still do on occasion, but not in the same way I used to do things. He was darting his eyes around the room as he spoke, seemingly feeling nostalgic. Business? Like deals and such? Well, it's not exactly as cut and dry as that, but yeah... So you still make deals with people's souls? I didn't mean to be so blunt, but for a devil who claims to have changed his nefarious ways, I couldn't help but feel like this was a bit of a contradictory concept. Not so much. Not anymore, anyway. He said with a chuckle. Hey, don't get me wrong. I still play the occasional trick on some of the most awful and downright evil buggers out there. Monkey's paw deals and the like, but I try to help those who have good intentions. I gave him a somewhat confused look, almost as much lost for words as how casually he was discussing something like this, as well as the implications of it all. He just gave me that classic smirk and said, I don't claim souls from good people, mate. Not anymore. I've spent a lot of time trying to right a lot of the wrongs I've done over the centuries. Sometimes I'll find alternate options to help them, but other times I'll just try to convince them they don't need my help. It's not always easy, but... Change never happens overnight. I couldn't help but smile while he spoke. There was something almost childlike to his face when he talked about things that were far above my pay grade. It felt as though he was getting away with sharing a secret he wasn't supposed to reveal. I can't say I wasn't tempted to pry a little more, of course. It wasn't long ago that all he would tell me was that he couldn't tell me much, but I didn't want to push him. I'd never had much luck getting him to share, even when he was just a cocky limey I shared my cell with. We sat in silence for a few minutes as we both sipped from our glasses. I still had so many questions I wanted to ask, but at the same time, I was enjoying this brief moment of peace. We hadn't had much of an opportunity to relax, not since things went haywire back at my home, and I think we both needed a moment to wrap our minds around all that had gone down, as well as what was to come. Unfortunately, those were things I would need to ask about, regardless of how relaxed I was growing. So, I said, bringing Grant's attention back from the stare down he was having with something in the middle of nowhere. What's the deal with Alberson Bridge? Alberson is, uh, well, an unusual place. Given the bizarre things I have witnessed in my friend's company, for him to consider something unusual was saying something. Still, I would neither comment nor interrupt while he spoke, as his words once more reverted to his business voice. I couldn't help but wonder sometimes which of the two was his genuine voice. Of course, it's far more likely that it's neither of those I've heard so far, only those that came with his human-shaped suits. Either way, I knew when he began to speak like this, shit was getting serious. The bridge itself is in some miles behind a small town on the other side of the country. The name of the town itself is of little importance, as the bridge itself was there long before any buildings were erected nearby. Many of the town's residents knew of the bridge, as well as the fact that it's only accessible on foot, 
for very few have ever followed that path after coming across the quite remarkable lake that flows beneath the bridge. I gave him a moderately confused look, or I'm fairly certain I did, as I was thoroughly perplexed by what he was saying. Sure, it's not hard to believe that some places can be reached on foot, as you can't squeeze a vehicle everywhere, but it didn't seem as if he was talking about thin trails in backwoods or hidden streets tucked away behind slender alleyways. You see, if you drive a car or even a bicycle up Albison Road, he said, with wide eyes and his classic smirk, you would simply arrive at a T-junction where the road meets Benson Way after a couple of miles. On foot, wearing neither shoes nor socks, however, the road goes on for considerably longer, eventually leading to Albison Bridge. Had I been told about something like this some years back, there's absolutely no way in hell I would have believed it. It's quite safe to say I have developed something of a more open mind than I used to have, of course. Naturally, even though I had complete faith in my friend, there was one specific aspect to this whole ordeal that I still couldn't quite figure out. So, this place is on the other side of the country, yeah? I asked, to which Grant formed another almost sneaky grin across his face, obviously fully understanding what my concern was. Why'd we come here, then? He replied, having returned to his normal speaking voice. Well, yeah. I shrugged. He just nodded his head to the single door at the back of the bar, wearing an expression that didn't read as one I would associate with playing some sort of prank. Sure, I had witnessed him jab a doorknob into thin air, eventually spilling the world open, but could this little tavern in the middle of downtown Atlanta, Georgia, send us so many miles away? I just stared at the door as though it was about to give me some sort of fantastical sneak peek of anything other than the likely dingy back alley that ran behind the building my friend and I occupied at the time. Unfortunately, neither my halfway mentally vacant stare nor the refreshing pint I had almost cleaned off was enough to prevent me from damn near leaping out of my seat when someone pounded heavily on the front door. It looked as though all of the color drained from Grant's face as we both cut our eyes towards the entrance. We gotta move, mate, he said, placing his palms on the bar to leap over. He sped to the payphone that was mounted on the wall next to the back door, reaching for the phone book that dangled from a chain below it. As he began leaping through the pages, I asked, What are you doing? Don't we need to head out? Not till I find where we're headed. What? Just trust me, mate. The second he pulled the phone from its cradle, the front door practically blew off its hinges. The shockwave from whatever threw it open knocked me to the floor, while Grant still wouldn't break his focus from the task at hand. He danced his fingertips across the keypad, entering far more numbers than any phone number should require. It's time to come home, boys. A familiar voice spoke from the doorway. I felt my whole body begin to tremble as I raised back up from the hardwood floor, while my eyes could not look away from Ashley, who held both of her hands outstretched towards me. You don't belong here anymore. Come home, Michael. Don't look at her! Grant screamed out, finally latching the phone. I was aware that I was lifting myself from the floor, but it didn't feel as though I was actually in control of my body at the time. While my legs began to march towards the girl I had once considered a friend, my mind was begging to take the wheel again. Grant, I muttered, barely grasping onto my ability to speak. I can't stop. Before I had a chance to finish what I was saying, I felt the fingers of my friend wrapping around my upper arm, spinning me in place to face him. Stay with me, mate, he said, slapping me hard across the face. For that second of sharp pain breaching across the skin of my cheek, my mind slipped back into my body. Michael, come home, please. Her voice sounded as though it whispered directly into my ear, while my brain once more struggled to force my legs to move. Grant dragged me closer to the front door at the back of the bar, but it still felt as though everything inside me was fighting against it. Everything but my brain, anyway. 
It continued to yell out in protest, but could barely convince my lips to allow the world to pass through. While Grant turned the knob, pulling the door towards me, I saw almost blinding light emitting from behind it. I managed to blink my eyes against whatever lay beyond the threshold, but as Ash spoke those same words again, even my eyes fell prey to her will. I'm sorry, mate, but you need to be in control to walk through, even if it's just for a second. He looked deep into my eyes while he spoke, sounding as though he was calling out from the other side of the block. Only her repetitive words were echoing within my skull, while my friend barely managed to squeak through. I'll fix it when we're clear. Just hang in there, brother. As soon as those words were whispered from a distance, I felt an almost unbearable agony erupt from my left arm. Finally, my mind collided with my body again. I shook my head while screaming out against the pain of the bones in my arm having been shattered. I wasn't fully aware of what caused it, but it had succeeded in bringing me back from whatever trance Ashley had put me in. Are you here? Grant asked loudly, his words echoing over her seductive wails. I just nodded before my friend pulled me through the doorway he stood directly in front of. In an instant, the sound of the floor and walls of the bar vibrating, along with the seemingly endless choir Brandon's girlfriend had been chanting, fell silent once more. I was momentarily confused as I stood, staring at the closed door of the old barn I now faced. Not only had the almost deafening sound of what happened at the bar left my ears ringing a bit, but the sun beaming down upon the dry, rotted wood of the ancient shack had my mind reeling. I snapped out of my pensive daze as Grant lay a hand on my arm again, causing my fragmented bones to piece themselves back together in an instant. He just gave me an awkward smile, accompanied by a shrug. He almost reminded me of a kid who just got busted doing something his folks told him not to. That sort of half-guilty, my-bad sort of look. So, uh, um, ouch, I said. Did you have to break every bone in my arm? I had to be sure, mate. You only responded to the slap for a second, didn't exactly have time to experiment. After a bit of an uncomfortable stare-off, with Grant darting his eyes from one side to the other in an attempt to avoid making contact with mine, I started to crack up. We weren't exactly strangers to bizarre and haunting events, so it didn't take long for me to find the humor in how he had brought me back to my senses. These were the moments that reminded me of how we had grown so close. Regardless of the fact we may as well have been from different planets altogether, we had the same batshit crazy sense of humor. We met in that dingy, awful prison so many years ago, and even there we found reasons to laugh. While we were treated like garbage by our superiors in the factory job, there were always opportunities to have a bit of fun. When I had no doubts, I would never see the outside of that haunting building that still wanted to drag me back. Even then, we laughed in the face of what it had planned for us. Perhaps, had it not been for those times, I wouldn't have been able to so much as giggle after what happened back at that strange little pub, but I had confidence in the fact that my friend had my back just as I had his. By this point, we had Ashley still in pursuit, the mysterious Alberson Bridge ahead of us, and not to mention the senior Mr. Orchid we hoped to find beyond that place. On top of that, Grant still hoped to find answers to who or what had played the part of Lucifer, someone who was apparently in league with the powers behind that maddening building. It was a lot, but I still tried to take it in stride. It couldn't get much worse than what I'd already lived through, right? I didn't ask too many questions while we made our way to the highway, just twenty or so feet away from the broken-down old barn. I was curious how close we were to the bridge, as well as what our plans were when we got there, but I think I enjoyed the peace of being surrounded by little more than sporadic woods, with the occasional vehicle speeding by on the road. After a good ten minutes of walking, along with my curiosity getting the better of me, I asked Grant about both where we were, as well as how we got here, 
The fact that only moments before we were drinking pints in a bar in downtown Atlanta and were now seemingly in the middle of nowhere, having left a run-down old barn, had my mind spinning in circles. I'd witnessed my fair share of unusual events throughout my fairly chaotic life, so I probably shouldn't have been all that bewildered by other circumstances, but that didn't make it any simpler. Eh, about fifty miles north of Vermont, he replied with a shrug, as though crossing the country through the back door of a pub was a perfectly natural occurrence. And? Uh, how'd your bar send us to a barn about fifty miles north of Vermont? I couldn't help but laugh when I repeated the question. Well, this is only one of the many doors it leads to, depending on the combination, of course. So, I know this is your line and all, but are you taking the piss? He went on to explain that not only was there a replica of the bar in every major city across the planet, replicas that were, in fact, the very same tavern we had only just fled from, but the back door was something of a gateway. Not only could it relocate him to just about anywhere in the world, but also to many different planes of existence. I still couldn't quite wrap my mind around it, but at least he didn't talk shit about how ridiculous British slang sounded coming out of my mouth. Within close to a half an hour after our hike from the broken-down old barn, we found ourselves standing right alongside the time-worn street sign labeled Alberson Road. When Grant knelt to begin the removal of his shoes and socks, I followed suit. In some ways, I was more nervous about potentially walking barefoot for miles than whatever awaited us at the end of the road. Even though I had spent a great deal of time shoeless in the sand over the past couple of years, I didn't know how well my naked soles would hold up on the occasional jagged rock. Given the fact that every bit of luggage I had brought along for the road trip was still in the back seat of my Bronco on the other side of the country, I didn't exactly have anywhere to store my shoes after slipping them from my feet. I just tied the laces together, hung them around my neck like a leathery necklace, and shoved my socks in my pocket. Grant gave me a smirk and did the same with his. Once we get to the bridge, we should be able to put them back on. Just watch where you step, yeah? He gave me a chuckle, gesturing to my wiggling toes with a tilt of his head. It was another one of those times where I wasn't entirely sure if he had somehow peeked into my thoughts or just knew me well enough by now to know where my head was at. After one more nod to confirm I was good to go, we set off down the road in pursuit of the elusive bridge, during which my friend regaled me with a bit of background knowledge on the unusual bridge. Where we're headed, it's not a place you'll find in any maps, mate. Uh, yeah, there'll be the occasional car driving down the road before cutting into the next one up, but the second we cross through barefoot, we're not on the same road anymore. For all we know, there could be a variable convoy speeding down Alberson Road as we speak, but they would be no more aware of us than we are of them. He was speaking as casually as if he was giving me directions to a local flea market while fishing a pack of cigarettes from the pocket of his cargo shorts, inspiring me to do the same. The only town nearby is some miles away, and many who live there are well aware of the existence of the bridge. Once in a while, a carload of curious teenagers or even some sort of paranormal investigators will come out this way, but even if they do know how to get there, they'll never be inclined to walk any further once they reach it. I won't even attempt to claim everything he was saying was quite registering with me, but he most certainly kept me interested. Were it not for his responsibilities, I couldn't help but think he could have made an amazing storyteller had his destiny led him someplace else. The way he spoke, it was impossible not to be pulled into his tale. Sometimes I thought he could just read off the instruction manual from a new vacuum cleaner and make it sound interesting. I can't speak to the reasons why those who seek it out feel no desire to walk any further once they reach the bridge, to tell you the truth. Maybe they're just intoxicated by the beautiful lake running beneath it, or perhaps somewhere in the back of their minds they can sense the dangers beyond. Of course, some have managed to go on, leaving their cars deserted by the opening to the road until they're removed. To my knowledge, there haven't been many who have crossed over into what lies beyond the bridge, but rarely do they make it back. Uh, dangerous? I asked, suddenly feeling a little more hesitant. Grant had asked me to stay behind. I can't deny that. Of course, I assumed that was more related to the fact that we were in search of Orchid Senior, not that the road to get there would be somewhat perilous. 
with how casually he talked about people essentially going missing, never to be found again, I had to wonder how Orchid's goons had managed to come and go as they pleased. If nothing else, the knowledge that hired guns would be able to go back and forth made me feel far more confident that I had nothing to worry about, especially with Grant by my side. The moment we crossed onto this road, we entered another plane, another level of reality. You get me? I gave a shrug and a nod to confirm. It made sense, even if this sort of thing was generally above my understanding. On the other side of the bridge, we'll descend a bit further into other realms. For the most part, I can keep you safe, though every plane comes with its own rules, for lack of a better term. It was only then, as the conversation had reached a more serious point, that I realized my friend's accent had reverted to his business voice. That, more so than the topic at hand, was what suddenly inspired my back to tense and my heart to race a bit quicker. I won't be quite as stripped down as I was in the old factory, but I most certainly won't be in my full strength either. Not while I'm like this, anyway. He gestured to his body, as though to introduce me to his freshly dry-cleaned meat suit. But I need you to stick with me, yeah? Don't wander off, don't take your eyes off the path ahead, and do what I say, when I say it. You get me? He stopped in place, turning to face me with something of a stern expression on his face. I get you, man. Just trust me, mate. Always. I gave a less than enthusiastic false smile accompanied by another shrug. I don't know if it was the full-on goofy expression my face wore while my mind still attempted to wrap around what he told me, or just the exaggerated, phony grin itself, but Grand burst out laughing. And naturally, I joined in. There we were my closest friend and I, standing barefoot on the road to a bridge nestled underneath our plane of existence, crackling like freaking idiots under the blistering sun. Though we've been through almost literal hell together, there was just something about being around him that made me revert to the fun-loving child I never had the opportunity to be. Perhaps it was my brutal and anguished childhood that allowed me to find the humor in the darker times, but I felt as though that was something we had in common. We were from two different worlds, but it was our scars, I think, that set the seeds for our friendship. Maybe some will never be able to accept that the devil himself was able to change, to become a better and braver person than most, but I know who he really was. He told me once that everything Grant said and did was from him, and I think I never really put all that together in my minds before all of this. He admitted to me the atrocities he committed so many lifetimes ago, once the truth came out, he didn't try to portray himself as the hero of the story, only one who found a better way. I don't care who Lucifer was, but I know who he became. Sorry, I got off on a tangent again. After Grant laid out a vague idea of some of the dangers ahead, we pushed all of that to the side for a time. The walk to the bridge itself probably lasted a good two hours, but we spent the majority of that time cutting up and laughing just like we always did. We probably went through a pack of cigarettes between the two of us throughout the course of our stroll. A casual observer would have likely thought we were headed to the damn circus, or even that we were wasted or something, with how we carried on. But once the laughs began, there was no stopping them. It was like a damn floodgate full of chuckles had busted open, and we couldn't remotely hold them back. I couldn't even remember the last time I heard so many buggers, wankers, and tossers in such a short period but my face was hurting from laughing so much. As soon as we set foot on the wide wooden bridge, it almost felt heavenly to press my soles against the smooth planks, as opposed to the rough concrete we had been strolling across for hours. Grants had not remotely been exaggerating the beauty of the lake beneath. It looked crystal clear and so inviting that I almost gave in to the urge to leap over the railing. While he began to slip his socks and shoes back on, I just gazed over the side, taking in the gorgeous water that rippled below us. With how hard the sun had been beaming down on us before, I wanted nothing more than to allow the subtle and steady flowing rapids to guide me wherever they may. I mentioned that very idea to my friends, but he just shrugged and told me he had no bloody idea where the river led, only that it was likely not our world to explore. 
Naturally, that only made me more curious, but not enough to act on the impulse to jump. It might be another day, mate, he said with a smile. I could tell he was as interested as I, but we couldn't afford to distract ourselves from the path ahead, one that I was suddenly feeling quite nervous about. It had been easy enough to speculate about the dangers ahead while we were still on the road, but now that we were on the cusp of it, I was feeling far more apprehensive. Grant sat down upon the planks while I slipped my shoes back on before we lit one final duet of smokes before moving on. Also, I think we both needed to take a minute to rest our aching legs. I couldn't speak to whether or not he experienced muscle aches or cramps while dressed in his meat suit, but I knew mine felt as though I'd run a damn marathon. We talked a little more as we leaned against the railing, just shooting the shit about potentially taking a more relaxing trip when all of this was behind us. We hoped that it may be possible to bring Brandon along for that one too, though whether his girlfriend would be invited was still up for debate. It did reawaken that sadness within me while we spoke of my housemates and business partner, but I wasn't about to rule out bringing him back home. Not yet, anyway. When Grant's knees and back popped and cracked as he got back to his feet, I couldn't help but smile a little when mine did the same. It would seem we were indeed more alike than I had thought, or it was simply the effect of the rules of different planes, as he had said. As we slowly paced to the end of the bridge, we pinched the cherry of our cigarettes off before sliding the butts into our pockets. I just did what he did on this, as I did not quite know if snuffing out a smoke on a bridge such as the one we were on would be acceptable or not. Grant stopped right at the very last plank before we would walk onto the concrete on the other side. I just looked at him while he gazed out into what lay beyond. Of course, all I could see ahead of the bridge was more forest-lined road, not much different than the path we walked to get here. Still, I wasn't about to move until he did. But his hesitation was making me far more nervous than if he'd just screamed for me to run at the top of his lungs. Ready? He said, after a heavy sigh. As I'll ever be. Stay close to me. Keep your eyes on me at all times, no matter what you hear. If we do get split up, don't shout out, don't stop moving, but do not run. You with me? Yeah, I'm with you, brother. He gave me a single nod before stepping one foot upon the concrete. With that lone footstep, his whole body suddenly appeared blurry and out of focus, almost. For a split second, I damn near allowed myself to give in to the burgeoning panic, but I managed to keep my cool. Without giving it a second thought, I placed my foot on the road beyond the bridge. But when my friend suddenly came back into focus, everything else around us was not what I had expected to see at all. It felt and looked as though we were fighting our way through a horrendous hurricane. Given the fact that I had lived on a beach for two years, I was no stranger to how brutal such storms could be, but I had never experienced anything like this. It was similar to those sci-fi experiments making tornado effects with smoke. The fog was thick, but almost lined in an almost turquoise haze, with the wind violently slicing through it in one direction or another. I felt my body sway and shift, threatening to send my barely controllable footsteps in any direction but the one my friend was going in. Even though he was only a foot or two ahead of me, he was hard to see through the rippling mist, as well as the thick blots of rain beating against and around me. I wanted to call out, or even just scream to convince myself I was still in control, but I was warned that it'd be a bad idea. I couldn't say what the reasoning was behind this request, but I didn't need to know that, only that I shouldn't under any circumstances. I was unsure how long we would have to travel before we reached whatever our destination was to be, but I was sure I couldn't maintain this for long. I almost felt like trying to walk through waist-deep water with the tide plowing the waves against me. Every single step required such effort I was already winded from the short distance we'd walked so far. Though Grant had told me to keep my eyes on him, I had to fight against the urge to look around me and up to the sky. There were flashes of near-blinding light emitting from all around me, inspiring me to seek out its source. But I did what was asked of me. Well, I did it first, anyway. As something that seemed like lightning blasted against the ground only feet from where I pushed through the storm, my head turned before I had a chance to stop it. That's when I noticed the shadows. 
There were so many that my eyes couldn't even register them all. Each one looked as though it was flailing its limbs against the wind and rain. It was like being in the middle of a parade or something, as mine was only one of so many faces in the crowd. Of course, though, I couldn't make out any details. Something about these silhouettes felt not entirely human. I couldn't exactly put my finger on it, aside from the fact they looked like nothing more than darker and thicker chunks of otherwise wispy and grayed fog. There were so damn many of them, just weaving in and out of one another's path as if this was some bustling city street. I could tell that some were closer than others, but even the ones I felt as though I could reach out and touch looked as though they had no actual, physical mass. I flashed back to when my friend and I were blindfolded in the woods during the Orchid Grand Festival when I broke my staring eyes away from those whose company were shared to see no sign of the men I had been attempting to follow. I felt my heart skip with the realization I did not simply have the option of removing my helmet this time. I just stopped in place, cutting my gaze in every direction. I had been keeping up the same pace while I investigated my surroundings, so I was sure he couldn't have gone too far away from me. Of course, that was a rational thought, one that couldn't quite make a dent in my chaos-fueled fear at the time. He told me not to scream out, not to yell and draw attention to myself, but I hoped I could at least talk. I couldn't hear anything but the calamity of the storm around me, but I hoped my friend would be able to hear me. Grant, where are you? Only a crack of lightning responded to my words, once more striking the ground only feet from where I stood. I can't say if there was some sort of shockwave from the blast beside me or that it simply scared the shit out of me, but I almost leapt to the other side, stumbling to the ground. I pressed my palms to what I had assumed to be concrete to find a texture I had never felt before. It was warm and sticky, flexible but firm. I had to peel my hands away from it, but it left no residue on my skin. In a way, it felt as though I had been walking down the esophagus of some enormous creature, but I battled against allowing that visual imagery to sink in. I finally pushed back to my feet before beginning to walk again, still speaking my friend's name over and over with each step. I wasn't entirely sure if I was even going in the right direction anymore, but I knew I had to keep moving. After walking for another few minutes, I felt my shoulder bump against something, almost sending me back to the ground. Whatever I hit let out some sort of grunt, though it almost caused my stomach to churn in the way the sound vibrated against the howling wind. Another hit from the other side pushed me into a third from the right again, and I suddenly understood how a pinball must feel as it bounced from one obstacle to the next. I was no longer following the isolated path, but the more crowded section of the street, it would seem. Regardless of the fact I was now making regular contact with whatever these silhouette things were, I could still make out no more than their somewhat deformed and inhuman shadows as I bounced from one to the other. There were so many of them that I had no way of getting clear before I rammed my shoulders and arms into another. I had no doubt I had strayed far from the path my friend had hoped to guide me down, nor did I believe myself to have a hope of finding it again. That was until I felt a hand grip around the top of my left shoulder. This way, mate. A voice I hoped to belong to Grant said almost directly in my ear. Though the words he spoke assured me that it was indeed who I hoped it was, the vocal tones sounded almost gargled and strained. At the time, I chalked it up to being no more than the effect of the bizarre acoustics of this place, but when he began to push me in a different direction than the one I had been almost blindly following, I got a little more at ease with the fact he was guiding me back to the right pathway. I'm sorry, mate. I should have done this from the beginning. No, I'm sorry, man. I got distracted. I know you told me. No worries. You're gonna be just fine now. As the crowd of shadows began to thin out, I hoped we were nearing the end of our journey. Even the thick fog was beginning to dissipate as the storm calmed down around us. I breathed a heavy and grateful sigh that this whole ordeal may finally be reaching its end when I was able to make out what appeared to be some sort of unusually shaped building ahead. It looked tall, but quite thin. It leaned to one side of the base before shifting dramatically to the right in the middle. As we got closer, I realized it was not a structure, but a massive tree with a cavern-like entrance facing us. See? The voice spoke, 
sounding graveled and almost ancient. I told you we would make it. The hand on my shoulder spun me to look upon what had led me away from the crowd of shadows. Night. I could not hold back the scream that breached my lips as I looked upon the twisted face of what was most certainly not my closest friend. It looked like some sort of stitched together puppet made of flesh. What appeared to be meaty twigs and glossy red fibers pushed through the splits in the uneven threads holding it in one piece. It had thick and curly hair on the left, while the right was bald as a cue ball where another seam ran down the center of its face. One eye was twice as large as the other, while the wide mouth reached from just below the long and slanted nose to where more yarn hung from where the crease of its smirk touched an upside-down ear. It looked taller than me, but was hunched over, bringing us to eye level. The rags of clothing it wore were just as pieced together as almost every inch of its body. The left arm hung significantly lower than the right, while more of those sticks jabbed through the gaps between the stitches. Don't scream, Michael. You're safe now. As it forced its mouth to smile even wider, the yarn holding its lips together on the smaller side popped, causing the lower lip to split and hang open like an unbuttoned pair of pants. I tried to back away, not caring if I would have to just haul ass back to the crowd of God knows what, but at my first motion, it grabbed onto my shoulder again. It began to drag me towards the opening in the tree, regardless of the punches I was landing against the almost plush, feeling skin of the arm that pulled me along. Finally, as it set one parody of a human foot across the threshold of the mouth of the darkened cavern, I rammed my fingers through the wide stitches on the forearm that held on to me. It wailed a howling shriek as I spread apart the loosely tied flesh, pouring the slick roots and fiber across the ground. I kicked against the midsection of the thing as I yanked myself away from it, tearing the remaining strips of skin and meaty strands with the head still latched onto me. I wasted no time before sprinting away, leaving it echoing its anguished screams as it gathered up its bits and pieces from the sticky ground. I peeled the disembodied hand from my shoulder, tossing it to one side as soon as I got it loose. I ran until the thick mist began to surround me once more, attempting to scale the outskirts of it like a wall, with the storm echoing around me once more. After reminding myself of Brant's words, I slowed my pace, hoping that my moments of weakness had not drawn any further attention. I kept on that road for what felt like ten to twenty minutes, trying to control my pants and whimpers so as to not alert anything else to my presence. As I plundered onward, I noticed a subtle light through the fog, something I was not sure whether or not to seek out. Even with the bright stabs of lightning reaching through the sky above, the soft glow remained constant. Whether or not this would bite me in the ass, I made the semi-conscious decision to head towards it. The closer I got, the more I grew aware of the sound emitting from it. Though I was still on the outskirts of the storm, I could make out little more than the cracks of thunder and splashing of the thick droplets of rain beating against me and the ground. But as the light grew brighter, the louder the concerned voice of a cocky, limey calling out my name sounded. Regardless of the vibrations of the thick air distorting everything else around me, the words calling out to me were unmistakably coming from my friend. I took no hesitation in speeding towards the light until I could finally make out the shape holding his glowing hand above his head. I practically tackled him, not so much as slowing down for a second until I wrapped my arms around him. I thought I lost you, mate, he said, folding his shivering arms around my back. I thought I did too, I replied, attempting to force out a falsified chuckle. Throughout the remainder of our journey through the madness of what lay beyond Alberson Bridge, I filled Grant in on how I had gotten myself lost, along with what I had to fight against to reach him again. It would seem that once we got through what he called the worst of it, the rest was pretty easy going. The fog finally dissipated completely, as did the raging storm. I could still hear the thunder and see the flashes of lightning illuminating the world around us, but I felt my feet clapping against the concrete again before I knew it. Though I was tempted to pry more, I chose not to ask what else may be out there in that place, as I planned to not take my eyes off of him on the round trip. 
We walked side by side, as opposed to the follow-me technique that didn't work out so well, and though my heart was still in overdrive from what I had experienced from back there, I felt so much more at ease now that I was with Grant once more. Even before I knew who he was, I still felt more assured when I was around him. I suppose that's just the effect of being in the presence of a dear and trusted friend. When the sky began to darken as though we had strolled into the middle of a moonless night, Grant fished his cigarettes out of his pocket once more. I took that as my cue that it was now safe to light one up myself, and that alone inspired my pulse to regulate a little more. Not at all am I endorsing smoking, boys and girls, but for a nicotine addict, it's like a damn breath of fresh air, and God knows I needed it after what I've been through. We're close now, mate. Yeah, close to what, exactly? That, he said, pointing towards the almost Scooby-Doo-inspired mansion on the hill off in the distance. That's the end of the road. If Orchid's out here, that's where he'll be. Uh, so, any idea on what to expect when we get there? Not sure, but don't fret, mate. We got this, yeah? If you say so. I gave a fairly forced chuckle, to which Grant returned that cocky smile. If nothing else, his demeanor didn't seem tense or scared, but he was a hell of a lot less breakable than I. Still, he'd brought me back from the brink of death before, so that wasn't for nothing. Yes, I was pretty fucking terrified. I won't even attempt to lie about that fact. If someone chose to live in a place that could only be accessed by going through whatever the hell that was back there, I could only assume they were more intimidating than anything that surrounded us during that storm. I can't deny that that little voice in the back of my head was quite pissed at me for not jumping at the chance to let Grant do this alone, but I knew it was the right call. No matter what power he possessed, nor the fact that I had none, except for being quite adept at kicking some ass, nobody should have to face something like this alone. He was the best friend I ever had, and I would be damned if I would let him face this without me by his side. As we drew closer to the large and ominous building, the fairly wide open space narrowed down. Blackened and almost foreign-like trees lined the paved road we walked on. With Grant's nod, we moved closer to the tree line, which gave me a better view of what we were facing. The mansion itself looked to be about three floors tall, not counting any potential lower levels. The walls were jet black, not indifferent from the very place we were seeking answers to, though they were not that same glossy and almost organic in appearance. There was a tall, ironwork fence surrounding the wide-open area of the house, with a fair amount of armed guards patrolling back and forth. It would seem the senior Mr. Orchid was somewhat paranoid, especially given the unique location in which he lived. I couldn't help but think that such extraordinary security measures were put in place to protect him from the very man whose company I shared. I found myself wondering how much Orchid knew about the being who sentenced his son to early damnation, or the circumstances of how he left this world. Well, uh, the world we left behind when we entered Alberson Road. I assumed he may not have any actual idea of who truly sought him out, as he had only sent a handful of hired guns to deal with us, but that could have been no more than a trap. Maybe he was well aware of the true identity of Grant Bailey, having sent a few pawns to essentially make us think he had the upper hand. Of course, it could very well be that I was overthinking things again, as I tend to do. Admittedly, I was quite paranoid myself with everything the Orchid family had already put us through so I wasn't about to let my guard down, not with the eleventh hour approaching. We crouched down only fifty feet or so from the tall and hauntingly elegant gate. While I studied the movements of the guards, as well as any potential openings to reach the building, I noticed Grant was acting strangely. I had to cover my mouth to prevent the gasp from escaping when I turned to see him with the forefinger and thumb of his right hand pierced through the flesh of his left forearm. Before I had the chance to inquire as what the hell he was doing, he pulled a blood-stained key from under the skin. As he wiped the blood from the small, simple key across the leg of his shorts, I watched the hole in his arm seal back shut. No matter what I had witnessed since I met him, those were sights I don't think I'd ever get used to. Once the stains had been cleansed from the treasure he had pulled from his flesh, he held it out towards me. I gave him a puzzled look, but held my hand out nonetheless. 
I was quite surprised when the metal didn't feel remotely sticky when he dropped it into my outstretched palm, considering where it had been previously located, but I was still very uncertain what this was all about. If anything goes wrong in there, anything at all, he said, gesturing towards the house looming over us. Slide that key into any lock. Doesn't matter if it's a door, a closet, or a bloody cabinet. As long as you can fit through it, it'll take you back to the pub. You get me? Grant, I'm not going to leave. Please, mate. I need you to agree to this. His expression he wore while he stared deeply into my eyes was one I had only seen maybe once before. There was fear behind his gaze, something that instantly caused my heartbeat to quicken once more. I still couldn't quite find the words, as I could not imagine any scenario in which I would flee from not only my friend, but the only person who had a chance of protecting me against the things I could not wrap my mind around. Michael, he said, defaulting back to his business voice again. I have no idea what we may face in that place. My words were still frozen in my throat. I was already scared, but seeing the anguish in Grant's face escalated that fear tenfold. I cannot and will not put you in harm's way. Some I have exposed you to far more than I ever wanted to. I need your word, mate. That was the deal, yeah? You do what I say when I say it. I just nodded my head though I can't exactly say I fully intended to do what he asked. That was until he gripped his hands around my shoulders, something that still flashed my mind back to the day my father tossed me through the bedroom window. The fact that my friends knew all about that one made me realize how serious he was about this. If I tell you to run, please, Michael, I need your word that you'll find the nearest lock, use the key, get to the pub, and don't look back. Make sure you remove the key and close the door behind you. I cut my eyes from him to stare at the key I held. It felt like an excuse to look away for a moment. Do you trust me, Michael? I lifted my head again, seeing the intensity having left his face, replaced by that all too familiar smirk. With my life, I said with an accepting nod. What you say, when you say it. You have my word, brother. Good man. He gave me a wink, accompanied by a click of the tongue, one of those things that felt like something only the English could pull off the right way. I slipped the key into my pocket, which I would pat or grope regularly to ensure it remained in place over what was to come. I still hoped it would not come down to it, but I had given him my word. That was something I would never break. Not to him. My skin was still trembling, but I had more faith in my friends than I ever had in anyone. I imagine that may yet seem bizarre, considering who he is, though even to this day, I can't see Grant as anything other than the strong and kind-hearted person I knew. Nothing would ever change that, not to me. So, I said, staring out at the security staff, pacing back and forth. What's the plan? How do we get in? Front door, mate. You're not serious. What about the guards? You're not gonna... I felt my words catch in my throat once more when I turned to see Grant with his eyes tightly shut. His jaw was clenched while his hands were both balled into fists. When I heard the first one drop to the ground, I whipped my head around once more. I felt my jaw droop almost lifelessly as every one of the guards fell out, one after the other. What? Did you? I, I mean, they're not... They're not dead, mate. Just sleeping it off. He was panting heavily while he spoke, which, given the fact I had witnessed him snapping forty fingers backward without so much as breaking a sweat, left me a little perplexed. Just give me a minute, yeah? You okay, man? I'm good. Ironically, it would have taken far less a toll on me to kill the buggers. He said with a laugh still breathing heavily. Much more tricky to knock him out for a bit, and more focus, you know. No, I said, returning his chuckle. I don't know, but I'll take your word on it. After a few minutes, his breathing regulated. He rolled his neck and climbed back to his feet. 
I followed his lead again as we casually strolled towards the tall gate before he convinced it to open with a simple flick of his wrist. The hinges screamed, causing a chill to run from the base of my spine to the top. As strange as it may sound, I was almost hoping for some stealthy maneuvering or even something of a fight with the guards to get in. No, I wasn't exactly rooting for any potential harm to come to either of us or the ample security team, but I was in favor of it taking us some time to find a way into the house. Even if more delays would have inevitably led to my body growing considerably more exhausted than it already was, I wasn't entirely prepared to come face to face with whoever or whatever we would meet within those quiet, eerie-looking walls. As we approached the twin doors that led into the building, I craned my neck up to truly take in the size of the place. Though it appeared to be a good-sized mansion from where we hid behind the trees, there was most certainly a sense of dread taking roots in the pit of my stomach as I took in the sheer magnitude of it. Sure, it was little more than a rattly old shack compared to the gargantuan behemoth of a building the old factory led us to, but I still couldn't shake the foreboding of entering such a place of our own free will. Once more, Grant waved the double doors ajar, and I found my eyes meeting another wide-open room with a winding staircase on either side of the back wall. It almost appeared as though the owner of this house had modeled its design on that maddening place we almost lost our lives to. Even the inner walls were painted a similar glossy black, though they did not seem to harbor life. Not as far as I could tell, anyway. Well, this is unsettling, Grant said, giving me a sideways look. I just nodded, finding my voice hidden behind my thumping heartbeat. So, Grant said with a mischievous smile. Up or down? Uh, no idea, I said. Uh, but this guy seems like a top floor kind of fella. From what I could tell from the lobby area, there appeared to only be two or three floors above us. I exhaled a grateful sigh when my eyes met the ceiling of the house and not an endless stream of upper levels. I found the place almost unnervingly quiet, as though we were its only occupants at the time. I knew better than to allow myself that false sense of security, but given the abundance of guards on the exterior, I was quite surprised to find nobody awaiting us inside, and not on the ground floor, anyway. The floor creaked beneath my soft footsteps, something that caught me off guard, given the vast wealth of who I assumed to own the place. Even Grant wore a puzzled look while we crept towards the staircase on the back left, with the floor panels lightly squealing with every step. We were only halfway across the room when a voice bellowed from a speaker somewhere above us. Welcome, Mr. Bailey and Mr. Burden. I could have imagined it, but I swear the voice sounded identical to that of Jensen Orchid, someone I knew could not be here. Of course, it's not hard to believe that a father and son could have similar mannerisms, but I suppose I had expected the senior Orchids to have a much more aged and withered tone. If anything, he sounded almost lively and carefree in the way he spoke. Quite an impressive job with my exterior guards, I must say. It would seem that at least some of the rumors are true, though I am well aware you are not who you claim to be, Mr. Bailey. You ain't seen nothing, Orchid, I yelled out, far more arrogantly than I had a right to be. Grant just wrapped his fingers around my arm, along with a subtle nod. I just shrugged and returned a slightly ashamed smile. And who is it that I claim to be? My friend asked aloud, having reverted to his business voice again. You tell me. Is it Grant Bailey from Liverpool, England? Or is it Lucifer himself? Either way, if you will forgive my crudity, you're full of shit on both accounts. Is that right? Grant asked. You have gifts, my boy. I cannot deny that. But you are no devil. And what makes you so sure, Mr. Orchid? Silly boy. The voice said with a condescending chuckle. I happen to know the real Lucifer quite well. She is a close friend of mine, as a matter of fact. Perhaps you could introduce us, then. We could clear all this up face to face. There was no response. Not yet, anyway. 
Grant had that same intense look on his face that he wore when studying the friendly goon, Mr. Green, some years back. I knew this expression was not one of mild curiosity, but desperation to get to the root of something deep into the guts of the mystery at hand. My heart was still jackhammering behind my sternum while my thoughts were all over the place. Why, if he knew we had rendered his security team unconscious, would he allow us just to walk right through the front door? For what reason was he essentially shooting the shit with us over an intercom? If he was so certain that my friend wasn't what I knew him to be, why was he just casually throwing that out there? I could barely focus on one question before another leapt from the back of my mind to the front. Tell you what, the disembodied voice said after a short delay. If you can make it to the top floor where I happen to be located, I'll introduce you. She's here then, Grant asked with a slight smirk. Again, there was no response. Mr. Orchid, Grant shouted out, but there was still no response. He's fucking with us, I said. If nothing else, we have at least an answer to the up or down to bay, he said, gesturing towards the steps. With him being so damn cocky, you know he's gonna have some traps set up or something. Nothing we can't handle. Just stay behind. My friend did not have a chance to finish asking me to keep his rear before the floor fell out from beneath us. In that split second of feeling my body become weightless as it soared downwards, I just knew that this was the end for me. I was so mentally checked out that I had no idea how far we had fallen before Grant wrapped his arms around me, allowing his body to take the full force of the quickly halted descent to the hard ground below. Even with my friend providing life-saving padding for my far more fragile frame, I blacked out as soon as we hit. You all right, mate? I was still incredibly dazed when I came to, with my friend's worried face being the first thing I saw when I opened my eyes. I... yeah, I'm good. Thanks for saving my ass yet again. I chuckled as I sat up, straightening my back while trying to gather my bearings. He just gave me a wink, reaching his hand out to help me back to my feet. How long was I out for? Uh, just a couple minutes. Had me worried, though. I looked around to take in the new and unfamiliar surroundings. We stood in the center of a drab and dank, wide, circular room with four simple wooden doors. One to the front and rear of where we were facing, and one to either side. The rounded walls looked to be constructed of smooth rock, while the ground beneath our feet was no different from the concrete pavement we had walked barefoot across what felt like so many hours before. The ceiling was high above, and I couldn't see any sign of the opening we had dropped through, only more seamless grey, slightly hidden behind the darkness. There was no direct source of light, but it was bright enough for us to see our surroundings clearly enough. Fucking orchids love their damn games, don't they? Probably the only way the pompous tossers can get the bloody rocks off. With uncertainty of which, if any of the doors, would lead us to where our host was located, I absentmindedly reached into my pocket for my cigarettes. I offered one to Grant, and we lit up, while we debated which theoretical exit to attempt first. With how our surprising drop from somewhere above had caught us both off guard, Neither of us had any idea which direction we were facing in relation to which way we had entered the house. Were we able to decipher which way was which, it would likely aid us in finding our way back to the top, while any other direction could end up leading us away from the house. Of course, these were real-world ideas, and not those of wealthy, nefarious madmen. I couldn't help but laugh at my inner monologue come up with those very words, as they sounded like tropes that belonged in a James Bond movie, rather than the life of a regular person. Of course, many aspects of my personal history were far from regular, but you get what I'm saying, right? Uh, maybe we could open all the doors, uh, take a peek in each, and go from there? I suggested. Can't hurt. One at a time, though. No telling if there's something nasty waiting directly behind any of them. Good call. I can't say I wasn't nervous when we pulled open that first door, with my mind's eye picturing some pack of wild animals lurking behind or even thousands of gallons of water waiting to be unleashed. 
when there was no more than a vacant hallway lined with the same smooth concrete walls, I allowed myself to release the breath I had been holding. When the remaining trio was opening to reveal the same thing, I let out another sigh, as this had brought us no closer to our goal. Bugger me, Grant said, heavily exhaling himself. Each hallway looked to stretch farther than either of us could make out, revealing absolutely nothing to differentiate one from the other. After some back and forth, along with one more smoke for the road, we just decided to begin walking down one at random. As soon as we were only a few feet away from the door, it slammed shut behind us, echoing the sound around where we stood. As I walked back to make a quick check if it may have remained unlocked, I practically fell back to the hard ground again when a thick concrete slab swiftly dropped down before me, sealing all the other doors away from us indefinitely. Well, I said, after spilling a mass of profanity to the top of my lungs, guess we're going this way whether we're right or wrong. So we walked on. We may very well have been headed back towards Alberson Bridge for all we knew, but with any choice in the matter being locked away behind a damn concrete slab, we could only soldier onwards. If nothing else, it didn't take too long for us to reach the first obstacle in our plight to reach Orchid Senior, as well as whatever secrets he may hold about his good friend Lucifer. You're taking the sod in piss, Grant said aloud, glaring at what lay ahead. The gap in the concrete floor looked to be about forty to fifty feet long at first glance. The closer we got to it, the grimmer our circumstances appeared. I don't know if it was the long and jagged spikes that lined the base of the pits before us that caught my attention first, or the handful of bodies in varying states of decomposition impaled upon several of them. The gaping hole looked just as deep as it did long, making me wonder if we had made the worst possible choice after all. As I stared at this impossible task, with my jaw hanging open once more, Grant was hard at work trying to put a plan together. When he turned his head up to the ceiling, I followed his gaze to see a series of small, hand-sized rings dangling some six to seven feet above us. Each looked to be spaced a good five feet apart, but I couldn't help but feel they were some sort of red herring. I knew all too well how much the Orchid family loves to play with lower life forms such as ourselves. I somehow doubted there would be such a simple solution to this. Without a word, Grant pulled off his belt, slung it towards the first hoop, and pulled back right when the buckle wrapped around it. With his first tug, the ring detached on one side, with the other still holding firmly in place. Maybe the one side will be enough to hold us, he said with a shrug. Or it's just hanging on by a thread too, I replied. It didn't take us long to rule out scaling the pit from above. When I noticed the ladder reaching out of the far end of the hole, I gave my friend a nudge, gesturing towards it. We both got down on all fours, peering over the side to see if there was another on the side we were on. Of course not, I said, with another aggravated sigh. Maybe we could drop down on this side, work around the spikes, and climb out the other, Grant replied. I don't know, man. Even if there is any space between the spikes, that's a hell of a distance to drop and hope for the best. We both glanced down into the pits again, seeing that there was some space in between, but with the angle we were looking from, as well as how deep and dark the very base of the hole was, we had no way of knowing for sure. The last thing we needed was to somehow work our way down there and end up being trapped with no way out. Again, we began to puzzle this out, though our options were quite slim. Of course, when the rumbling came from behind us, I grew far more aware that we may well be shit out of luck on this one. As soon as I felt the ground shake, we both swung in place to see the concrete slab that hid our other options away from us steadily creeping in our direction, effectively giving us maybe minutes to figure out something before we would be pushed into the pit. Shit, I said. What the hell are we missing? Maybe the simple fact the bugger wants us dead. Grant said, almost nonchalantly. No, they like their games. Even as sick as these bastards are, they wouldn't put us in a no-win situation. They're fucking with us, man. There's always a punchline. Or a test. What? He believes his associate to be the devil, but he has his doubts, I suspect. 
What would you think to be the one defining aspect of Lucifer to someone such as our dear Mr. Orchid? I, I don't know. I... what? Horns? Forked tail? Pitchfork? Okay. A. That's racist. And two. Everyone knows the devil is evil. So what? Are you supposed to, like, throw me into the pit to get by or something? He just shrugged, as though this was such a simple and easy solution to our problems. Come on. Seriously? No, mate. I'm not throwing you into the bloody pit, but I do believe this is a sacrifice scenario. With the slab edging slightly closer and my brain feebly attempting to wrap itself around what Grant was saying, I found my thoughts interrupted when my friend pushed me up against the wall. He had me pinned by the arms, and I found myself momentarily freaked out by the fear that he may indeed have to toss me over to get by, until... We have to put on a bit of a show, mate, he whispered into my ear while I fought to get free from his grasp. You think he's watching? Of course he is. I don't see any cameras, but I have no bloody doubt he's well aware of every move we make. You better pull your punches, I said trying not to chuckle at the absurdity of having to stage a play for our overseer. He just gave me a slight wink before slugging me in the gut. Fortunately, he had indeed held back, but it still caught me by surprise. After I buckled over, falsely choking and gasping for breath, I reared my head back and punched him across the face. He backhanded me, almost causing me to lose my balance for a second, as we were still close to the edge. Grant instantly reacted when he noticed my foot slip a little, pulling me back by the collar and headbutting me, just as any self-respecting Manchester United fan should be able to do. I stumbled back to the wall, thrusting my foot up to meet his midsection, causing him to hunch over and ram his head into my stomach. We were making sure to echo a resounding oof or ah with each hit and every swing. In my head, it felt like a poorly choreographed fight scene acted out by some amateur improv group, but I hoped it looked real enough to our audience. Of course, I still wasn't entirely sure what the point of all this was until Grant tackled me, landing us both on the floor right beside the edge. When we get back up, you gotta push me over the side, he whispered. What? No, I, I can't. I'll be okay, mate. One of us has to go in, and no offense, but I bounce back a lot better than you do. Honestly, I couldn't argue he had a point. I watched him get drilled full of bullets without even losing track of what he was saying, but I still winced at the idea of throwing him to what would surely be certain death for any normal person. My whole body was beginning to shudder at the very thoughts of what he told me to do, but I had no doubt he knew this was what had to be done. Okay, but... I'll be fine, mate. You trust me, yeah? Always. With that, we wrestled back to our feet while Grant spun me in place with his back facing the gaping mouth of the pit. We still gave false jabs at one another, even with the concrete slab only ten feet or so from where we stood. He gave me a subtle nod to let me know the time had come. Though my back was as tense as the wall that was edging closer by the second, I couldn't help but take such a rare opportunity to have a bit of fun with the morbid act I was being forced to commit. This, I said, allowing a slight smirk to creep across my face. Don't. Is. I felt the laugh attempting to rise within me, but I forced it down behind the intense and angered expression I gave my closest friend. My, don't you fucking... Sparta! I screamed out as I stepped back with one foot, thrusting the other into his gut, sending him careening over the side. Wanker! Was the last thing I heard him say before I watched an especially thick and jagged spike breach from his chest, spurting blood across the walls and onto the floor on which I still stood. For a moment, I felt my heart stop. My breath caught in my throat while my head felt dizzy. Even when Grant ever so slightly raised his middle finger from the arm that hung limp beside him, my guts still churned at the sight of him just dangling there with his chest cavity spread wide. The vibration of the ground fell still as the slab stopped in place, maybe four or five feet from my back. A moment later, I felt another shuddering beneath me as a slender bridge began to work its way from my side of the pit to the one we had quite literally fought to reach. 
My legs were still trembling as I carefully paced across the slim walkway, but I felt the tension in my neck begin to release when I saw Grant pulling himself up the spike that ran right through him. By the time I got to the other side, he was already reaching from one sharp prong to the next, having freed himself from the one that would have surely laid anyone else to rest. If Orchid was indeed watching from some monitor up in his tower, I imagine he would feel quite befuddled by the sight of the man he thought to be an imposter climbing up the ladder to stand beside me once more. That alone gave me just as much satisfaction as seeing what was once a grizzled and bloody, gaping hole in Grant's chest having sealed itself back shut. Sparta, he said nudging me with his elbow, wearing an expression not unlike that of an exhausted parent. I just shrugged, unable to quite locate the words while he patted down his shirt as though he were wiping dust away, as opposed to adjusting the giant rip down the center. We both gave one final glance at the large pit while lighting a fresh cigarette, before moving onwards once more. We couldn't know what little surprise the elder Mr. Orchid had in store for us next, but I was certain our seemingly endless day was far from reaching its conclusion. We only had to walk for another few minutes after leaving the pit behind before we came across yet another decision to be made. We just stopped in place, staring at the staircase leading upwards to our right, as well as the hallway that continued onwards. On one hand, it would make the most sense to climb the steps as we hoped to find our way back up to the house in which Orchid surely lingered still. Of course, the fact that seemed the easiest and most logical choice was the exact reason we were hesitant to settle on it. We talked it over for a few minutes before the floor began to vibrate beneath our feet again, likely signifying the pursuing concrete slab was on its way again. That alone was enough to convince us to head up, not because we thought it would be the lesser of two prospective evils, but simply because we were both tired of rushing every damn decision based on a chunk of rock at our backs. As soon as I set my foot on the first step, it began to retract, inspiring us both to sprint up the stairs. I, for one, would have preferred a slower approach to check things out, but it would seem every move we made was on a timer of one kind or another. As we both practically leapt through the opening above, we found ourselves surrounded by darkness, except for the light still glowing from the gap in the concrete ground. Naturally, that snuffed out when the opening to the floor below sealed itself shut, leaving us unable to see a damn thing. I could feel my chest getting tight again, while my breathing grew more erratic with the fear of what else may be sharing the darkness with us. It would seem I had a moment of forgetting whose company I shared at the time, not dissimilar to how Orchid had underestimated him to begin with. When the light beamed from my friend's hand, just as it had in the foggy and blurry landscape of the space between Alberson Bridge and the house we fought to return to, I managed to regulate my pulse, finally. Have I ever told you I, I love you, man? I said, wiping the sweat from my brow, chuckling nervously. He just gave me another one of those tongue-click winks while cutting his eyes around our new location. From what I could make out, we looked to be in some sort of parking garage. For a moment, I thought we may have very well walked a good distance away from the house, having chosen the wrong direction in the circular room we fell into. I can't say it felt as though we had walked particularly far before we came across the spiked pit, but I had long since abandoned the logical reasoning of the natural world when it came to circumstances like these. Though the light Grant produced from his hand was enough to illuminate a good twenty feet around us, it still felt quite eerie being surrounded by so much emptiness, except for the occasional vehicle here and there. You know anything about hot wiring cars? I asked thinking a ride could make quick work of whatever this task had in store for us. He didn't reply, only appeared quite distracted while he stared around the place as though he was looking for something specific. That's what the expression on his face implied to me, anyway. Regardless of the years we had been friends, as well as how I could often read him like an open book, there were often times I had not the slightest idea what was going on in his mind. Uh, you okay, man? I asked. What's got you so spooked? I know this place, Michael. I can't
can't say whether the fact he spoke in his business voice or that he still appeared so on edge had me the more unsettled, but either way, I was most certainly more nervous about our surroundings than I had been at first. When Grant began to walk across the mostly vacant parking lot, still looking as though he was in something of a daze, I followed behind him. I tried to pry more into why he was acting this way, but it was as though my words didn't even register with him at the time. As he paced towards a dusty, cherry-red convertible 57 Chevy, he strode his hand across the driver's side fender, carving a fine ditch in the thick dust. The way he regarded the old car looked as though he was laying eyes on an old friend for the first time in years. He pulled the door open, sitting down at the helm, causing a cloud of dust to blow up and around him as he planted down into the seat. I still just stood in place in front of the vehicle when the glow from his hand dissipated, briefly returning us to the darkness. I heard the rumble from the engine when he cranked it up, before once more illuminating the wide and open space with the bright headlights. He still looked so mentally vacant while he sat in place with the door ajar beside him, just gazing at the dashboard. He ran his fingers across the steering wheel while pressing his foot down on the accelerator pedal. The exhaust coughed and sputtered before the hum of the engine regulated, bringing something of a distant yet warm smile on his face. Grant, are you alright, man? He just nodded, still wearing that almost melancholy grin. He gave his head a brief and subtle shake before looking back at me, tilting his head to invite me to sit shotgun. He no longer looked troubled when I took the seat beside him. He just raised his eyebrows up and down while revving the engine more as he closed the door, prompting me to do the same. Let me tell you a story, mate, yeah? Go for it. Given the expression both this place and the car we sat in had left on my friend's face, I was a little nervous about what this tale may concern, but at the same time, I was quite excited to hear him talk about his past for once. This was probably a good 60 or 70 years ago. Well, it goes back farther than that, but this place... His words were cut short by a shrieking howl that almost seemed to cause the walls to shudder. Without even hesitating, as soon as the sound broke out, Grant threw the car into gear and slammed his foot to the floor. I felt my back press against the seat as the wheels gripped onto the tarmac after spinning in place for a moment. More howls and almost guttural growls were echoing across the wide area, and even as we sped through the place, the volume of the wails did not lessen. If anything, they sounded to be drawing closer. With every turn, the tires squealed against the pavement, only serving to cause the sound of whatever was out there to seem even more disturbing. The winds that blew by the speeding car caused plumes of dust to blow behind us as we carried on. When a gargling barking came from possibly only feet behind us, I could only hope our smoke cloud would distract whatever was chasing us down. I realized that was only wishful thinking when we took a hard hit to the left rear fender, causing the wheel to release from the surface of the road for a moment. The squealing of the tires bellowed again as we skidded to one side while darting down the ramp to the level below us. As we sped to the floor ahead, I cut my eyes to the left, briefly catching a glimpse of the beast that was in pursuit. I didn't know if it left my sight so quickly that I didn't have time to make out what it was, or if my mind was so shocked by what it had seen that it would not allow me to register it. By the time the tires bounced onto level ground again, I decided to keep my eyes forward, hopeful we could escape this thing. With every sharp turn, the sound of thick, rubberized marks being painted across the tarmac echoed against every wall and ceiling above. No matter how hard Grant pushed the pedal down, the haunting sounds of those heavy footfalls and wails of the creature seems to be inching closer and closer. I had no idea what floor we may be on, how many we may have to pass through to escape the parking structure, nor if that would give us more or less of a hope of outrunning this thing. Hell, I still have no damn clue how we were god knows how many floors up a damn parking garage when we were underneath a fucking mansion only moments before, for that matter. What the hell is that thing? I yelled over the sound of the beast's wails, as well as the wind gusting around us. It doesn't have a name. It's not from your world or mine, mate. They travel between, feeding on whatever poor bastards might slip through the cracks. Can you hurt them? Not sure. Different planes, different rules. 
Another hit sent us skidding to one side, spinning us around and slamming hard against the wall, effectively halting our escape. That's when the headlights strone across the beast, bringing it truly into view for the first time. I could only barely catch the scream before it let loose, but I just smacked my hands around my mouth in an attempt to silence it. I wasn't entirely sure why I felt the need to muffle my terrified outcry, but my hands were shuddering violently as they sat upon my face. There we sat, face to face with this monstrosity. It had to be about six feet tall, even propped on its four legs, each ending with two elongated fingers and long, dark claws that looked as though they could slice through solid steel like warm butter. The limbs were packed with bulging, almost human-like musculature. It was completely hairless, but its grayed flesh was glistening as though layered with sweat, which, given how quickly it chased after us, would not be hard to believe. The spine was lined with a row of spikes, each of which pierced through the skin of its back. The head of this thing was the most disturbing of all its unique features, being almost human in appearance. The rounded ears on the sides, the upturned button nose on the end of a slightly protruding snout, and even the creased brow across its enlarged eyes. As it wrinkled its lips into a snarl, allowing a trembled growl to breach its mouth, I saw what looked to be rows of needle-like, thin teeth, far more numerous than those behind my lips. As we stared on, another two of those things approached from either side of us, inspiring my body to shiver even more violently than it had been up until this point. There, Grant said, gesturing towards what looked to be an elevator, maybe a hundred feet across the large open space. But at this point, all three of the monstrous beasts weaved around one another, staring at us, while pacing back and forth on their muscled legs. It felt like a classic showdown, making me almost giggle at the visual image of a tumbleweed drifting across the space between the front end of the car and the trio of the creatures. Of course, laughter was the last thing I could convince my body to do at the time. As soon as we get within range, you get to that door, yeah? We get to that door, Grant. I'll try to get as close as possible. Just be ready, he said, seemingly ignoring my words. Grant! He threw the shifter in neutral, revving the engine, while the beasts hunched over as they're preparing to pounce. Grant, seriously, we've got to... Before I could even hope to finish my sentence, I felt my back once more press against the seat as my friend threw it into gear, spinning the wheels in place before practically shooting us forward. The first creature we had seen attempted to ram the front end with its head, ultimately releasing a choked yelp as the bones of its neck gave a loud snap when it made contact. The other two jumped to the side, swatting their elongated limbs at us, one carving its claw across my right shoulder. I screamed at the sound of my shirts and flesh tearing open, but would not allow the pain to get through. I turned around in my seat to see the two that left to the side already back in pursuit, while the one that ate the bumper was shifting its neck back into place. Even with the growling of the other two, as well as the howling of the engine, I could still make out the sound of the bones twisting back into the right position, causing my stomach to churn from both the sight and sound. I felt as though we were about to plow the car right against the wall with the recessed elevator door before Grant quickly cut the wheels, skidding us to the left, while the burning rubber surrounded us in a foul-smelling cloud. Go! Grant yelled out as soon as the car came to a halt. I did what he asked and threw open my door, almost stumbling right to the ground as I pushed myself away from the old Chevy. Since he had gotten us so close, it only took a few seconds to reach the elevator, but I would now be forced to await the doors sliding open. I just kept pushing the button, as though it would speed the arrival of the elevator while keeping regular glances at my rear. I almost dropped to the ground as life left my legs when I turned to see all three of those things leap upon my friend as soon as he stepped out of the car. My jaw trembled and hung limp while I watched the blood spray across the hood of the old car as they reared back with their clawed hands, tearing into him one after the other. I couldn't even make him out anymore, only the monstrous grayed flesh of the beasts pulling their limbs and crimson-stained faces back, slinging more meaty globs and chunks of grizzled tissue against the surrounding area. I was only vaguely aware of the dinging sound, alerting me to the arrival of the elevator as I witnessed the gruesome sight of my friend being ripped apart. With that one high-pitched beep, all six of those darkened eyes met mine, as they stopped in place, turning from the meat they had made of my dearest friend. 
when I felt the door slide open against me, I just paced back, not breaking my gaze from the trio, which was now steadily approaching me. I'm not entirely sure if I pushed the up or down arrow as I was so fixated on the sight of my potential killers moving in, but the door would not slide shut no matter how many times I bounced my finger against the button I wouldn't look at. Finally, with the creatures only a handful of feet away from me, I gave up on my repetitive pressing, just stepping back until I hit the back wall of the lift. I could swear the one closest to me gave a satisfied smile as its head reached the entrance to the elevator, and I did not doubt that this was the end of the line for me. As my eyes looked deeply into its almost vacant and lifeless ones that gazed back at me, I only hoped it would make it quick. I clenched my fists, bracing myself from my bloody demise, when... Oi! Echoed across the otherwise deserted parking structure. Just as the beast closest to me turned its head, everything from its muscular upper shoulders to the tip of its little upturned button nose exploded into a mess of thick, glossy black blood and slivers of bone, revealing Grant standing only feet behind the two that remained. Didn't your mommy ever tell you to clean your plate before dessert? He said, his shirt in tatters with his flesh still sealing itself back together. One of the beasts charged right at him before the snap of his fingers left it in pieces, just as he had done to its buddy. The one that remained cowered down, sinking its head almost to the floor as it backed away from me. While Grant casually strolled towards the elevator, it continued to edge away from both of us, whimpering from its trembling mouth. By the time the creature was swallowed by the darkness surrounding the elevator, Grant walked in, turned around, and bounced his fingertip off the button with the upwards arrow. When the door finally slid shut, I exhaled the breath I had been holding for some time now. As the elevator shuddered and began its slow ascent, Grant leaned up against the back wall alongside me. Why didn't you just do that in the first place? I asked. Dunno, really, he shrugged. I wasn't sure if I could, I suppose. Didn't want to waste any time figuring it out. Oh, I replied, unsure of what else to say while he laid a hand on my shredded shoulder, mending my torn flesh, just as he had his own moments before. We stood in silence for the remainder of our short trip upwards. It wasn't until the elevator stopped, sliding its door to one side again, that I absentmindedly fished my cigarettes out of my pockets, offering one to my friend, as I did not know if his had survived the attack he seemingly could have avoided with little effort. When I stepped through the open door, inhaling my freshly lit smoke, I found I was staring at another glossy black wall, just like those in the room we had dropped from some time back. Please extinguish those, the aggravated voice of the senior Mr. Orchid said from a speaker somewhere nearby. Bugger off, Grant belted, while I outstretched my middle finger proudly, waving it from one direction to the next. Whether or not we were indeed back in the house belonging to the man we sought out, I didn't know at the time, only that the corridor the elevator brought us to was of similar decor to his home. Regardless of that, we had yet another decision to make as we stood just outside the door as it slid shut again. Left or right. I just looked at Grant with my cigarette dangling from my lower lip, shrugged, and asked, Flip a coin? He just glared at me with a we-are-not-amused look on his face, before reaching into his shredded shorts pocket, producing a sticky-looking, gore-lined quarter. He held it out towards me, raising an eyebrow. I gave a quick smirk, holding my hand out for him to drop it onto my palm. It landed with a slight splatting sound, instantly adhering to my skin. I almost gagged a bit as I wiped it on my pants, hoping to clear at least a little of the nastiness before giving it a toss. Call it? I said, flipping it in the air, before catching it on the back of my hand, covering it with the other. Tayo's left, head's right. Wanka. I couldn't help but laugh at the look on his face. He appeared almost disappointed that the coin hadn't launched itself right through my hand, as well as still irritated by me suggesting the toss in the first place. It didn't take long for him to crack up and our laughter echoed throughout the hallway we stood in, just as it had the cathedral-like room in which we said goodbye to the younger Orchid so long ago. When I finally removed my hands to reveal good old George Washington, informing us that we would be going to the right, we dropped our cigarettes to the floor, 
smearing them out on the likely expensive, classy-looking carpet. Once our brief moment of levity came to a close, we both became silent once more in anticipation for whatever surprises may lay ahead. The long walk down the hallway momentarily caused my mind to revisit that maddening building, just as it had so many times over the last couple of years. There was no doubt that Orchid had modeled this place after the one we'd hoped to be able to retrieve Brandon from, which gave credence to the idea that this was exactly where we needed to be to find answers. I know who's pretending to be me now, Grant said after a few minutes of silence. Yeah? That parking garage. That's where I thought she had died. Clearly I was mistaken on that. Don't you mean that's where you thought you killed me? A pleasant, feminine voice spoke from somewhere ahead. Grant stopped in place. The look on his face was one I'd never seen before. Something sad and almost ashamed with a side of shock. He glanced at me with eyes quivering and glassy, a sight that almost caused me to mimic his sorrowful gaze. He turned back to the path ahead, quickening his pace slightly as we walked on. I couldn't tell if it was excitement or anguish that inspired him to move more swiftly towards where the voice had called out from, but I was growing more anxious about finding the truth behind what happened in that parking garage. As we rounded a bend in the corner, we came to a large room which looked to be some sort of dining area. It appeared somewhat inspired by a restaurant or cafe, with a series of circular tables in no particular configuration, each one with between two and four tall chairs surrounding it. Upon one seat, in the very center of the room, sat a very glamorous and absolutely stunning brunette. She looked around in her late twenties, with dark skin, wide and lively bright green eyes, and a half-cocked smile, bordering on an arrogant smirk. Honestly, her expression was not indifferent to the one I had seen my friend make so many times over the years. Grant stopped again when he made eye contact with her, while she just stared back at him with that slightly cocky and almost mischievous half-smile. She got to her feet, revealing her long, slinky dress as it draped across her bare feet. As she strolled closer to us, I realized I had seen this woman before. She was the very same brunette I had felt watching me at the bar the night Grant showed up, the night we lost Brandon. Could she have been behind everything from the beginning? Been a long time, Lucy, she said, almost breathing the words more than speaking them, in an accent not unlike Grant's business voice. It has indeed, Cutter, he said, gazing into her eyes as though they could swallow him whole. Please don't call me that, sugar. She traced her fingers across the side of his face as they looked upon each other with such awe it was as though they had both longed for this very reunion. When she gave him another smirk, wrinkling her nose ever so slightly, she tilted her head, gesturing for him to follow her. Grant looked back at me again before cutting his eyes down to the floor. Again, he looked ashamed which I could only presume to be due to the nature of their last meeting, one in which he had apparently killed her, or thought he had, anyway. Given the fact that he had all but confessed his many atrocities to me before we parted ways some years back, I couldn't quite figure out what it was about this one that made him appear so broken up. Of course, with the way the two of them carried on, it was quite evident there was more to what they were than friendship. As I followed them back to the familiar open lobby area and to the stairs leading to the next floor up, I had a feeling whatever we had been hoping to find would be revealed soon. That, or something far worse. Either way, I could only hope all of the madness was reaching its conclusion, for better or worse. Neither of us spoke while we followed the gorgeous brunettes up one flight of stairs and on to the next. She didn't say a word either as she led us to an uncertain location, though I had to believe she was indeed taking us to meet Orchid Senior. That, or this was just one more mind game. Of course, that wouldn't exactly be a surprise at this point, but I hoped that all of the bullshit was behind us. Not only was I ready to find somewhere to hibernate for the next month, but I still held on to the idea that we could bring Brendan back home. 
Of course, neither of those things would be possible unless we got answers to all of the insanity. Regardless of how Grant seemed almost entranced by this woman again, I was sure it was she he had been referring to when he spoke of who had impersonated him to the Orchid family. If that was the case, it stands to reason that she was in league with the forces behind that enormous building that apparently still possessed a part of us, in one form or another. With all of that in my mind, I had no doubt this woman could not be trusted, no matter what history she shared with my friend. When we reached what I presumed to be the top floor, we followed our guide as she walked to the end of another long hallway, one that ended with a very elegant set of double doors, though they somewhat resembled the one that opened to reveal the massive room that Grant, Brandon, and I were shot in. They were a good deal simpler in their design. When the woman in red pushed them open, I almost audibly gasped upon seeing the man sitting behind the large mahogany desk at the back of the room. He looked almost the spitting image of his son, if not somehow more youthful in appearance. The expression he wore was that same arrogant and slightly disgusted one that the heirs of his throne would look upon us with, until he cut his gaze up to the brunette who led us to his door. When his eyes met hers, his lips formed a warm smile, not unlike a schoolboy staring at his crush. I watched on while she glided around the wide desk to stand by his side, laying her hand on his shoulder. When Grant and I entered, two men at each side of the room glared at us, one of which was tapping on the stock of his quite expensive-looking firearm as if to let us know it was locked and loaded. The other just scowled with an expression that made me feel like he was about to growl and bark or something. Both of the men appeared as though they may be as sharp as a basketball, but judging by their massive proportions, they were not hired for their intellect. Of course, it was not like this was the first time I had a trigger-happy goon staring me down, but I was pretty sure I could handle neither of those two in a fight. So, Orchid Senior said, staring down his nose at us. I see you've met the lovely Madame Lucifer. I hate to break it to you, Gov, but she's not who you think she is, Grant said. She just grinned back at him, knowing full well she had the old man under her spell. You certainly have gifts, my boy, but you should not presume yourself to be her equal. That's blasphemy, you know. Fair enough, Grant replied. Believe whatever floats your boat. I couldn't give a witch's tit about whatever arrangement you two have going on. I just want to know about the building. And that's where you reveal your hand, my boy, Orchid said with a condescending chuckle. The building is a gateway to hell. Surely the true Lucifer would be aware of that much. Is that right? Grant asked. Now, with that silliness cleared up, Orchid began again, seemingly completely sure of the truth of things. It's time for you to answer my questions, the first of which being quite simple. What did you do with my son? Your son? Grant replied. The one who fed us to that bloody place and almost left us dead. That one. Just answer the question, boy. Orchid sneered with pure hatred in his eyes. You kids in hell, Gov. Anyone with a handy-dandy gateway should have no problem tracking him down. Just follow screams that sound like a little girl stubbed a bloody toe. The old man screamed out, getting to his feet while slamming his fists down on the desk. I could see the veins throbbing in his temples, and I couldn't help but think a convenient aneurysm could make things so much easier for us. After a few moments of Orchid breathing heavily through gritted teeth, the woman in the red dress laid her hand upon his shoulder once more, convincing him to calm down. He studied his hands for a few seconds, flexing them open and shut, as though to make sure they still worked properly after his tantrum before he sat back down on his comfy-looking high-backed chair. So, you did kill them, then, he said, releasing the tension of his brow. So be it. He was always a disappointment to me. Fortunately, I do not need an heir just yet, not with the devil herself having preserved me so well. He looked as though he had almost composed himself when the woman to his right let out an almost insane cackle that caused every eye in the room to turn in her direction. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, she said, still gasping from breath in between her maddening, wailing laughs, buckling over and chuckling at her side. 
It's just too good. I can't. She lost it again, pounding her own fist against the desk while tears streamed from her enlarged and maniacal eyes. Okay, okay, I'm good now, she said, straightening her back out while rubbing her reddening eyes. What in the world? Orchid said, staring up at her in shock with his jaw hanging agape. I am so sorry, honey. You have no idea how long I've waited for this day. I just got a little bit excited is all. What are you talking about, my dear? The old man asked, still looking thoroughly perplexed. Grant glanced over to me with an almost apprehensive look on his face. I tilted my head back towards the door as if to suggest we get the hell out of here, but he just shook his head subtly. Let me tell you a story, my dearest Jeremiah, the woman said, finally having calmed from her fits of laughter. I can't honestly say if I recall her story verbatim, but what she shared, only moments before my world fell apart, was not entirely what I expected. Yes, I knew Grant was ashamed of whatever went down between the two of them, but I don't think I fully understood what he was going through at the time. Nobody said a word while she spoke. No interruptions, only silent reactions, but be it shock or respect that allowed her to keep the spotlight until her tale reached its end is not for me to say. This is what she revealed to us. Hell has been around for longer than most humans realize. Long before Adam and Eve were even a thought, the demons who inhabited the underworld were still searching for their purpose in their world. When more and more feet began to walk the earth, unsure of where they belonged, they gave in to their baser instincts, inflicting harm on others, stealing from them, hurting them, thrusting themselves upon one another. They have no idea of the damnation that awaited them, and honestly, the demons did not know how to expect their arrival either. Though they were not exactly given an instruction manual when the mutilated and grotesque souls began to fall from your realm to theirs, they somehow knew what had to be done. As the years passed, they learned to torture those who fell through the gateway, tearing into them with the crude tools they threw together for the task, or even just their clawed fingers and talons. It was something of an inherent skill they were never before aware they even possessed. It wasn't hard for them to inflict those awful acts upon these hideous things, as a soul that is sent to hell is thoroughly disgusting to look upon. Oh yes, when you find yourself in hell, Mr. Orchid, you will not have such gentle features and smooth skin. No, your acts in life define the appearance of your soul, and I would imagine yours is quite revolting by now. Some demons were specialists, having honed their skills to more of an art form than just a job. One of these more talented lords of the underworld was named Cutter, due to her admirable skill with anything bladed. These gifts led Cutter to be amongst the most highly regarded demons in the realm, earning the respect of so many of her peers. Think of Hell as an infinite cityscape, with tall skyscrapers lining the world as far as the eye can see. As for cities of this world, they are upper-class and lower-class sections, celebrities and wealthy citizens who live and work in the lap of luxury, while others, well, you get the idea. Cutter earned her very own building in the heart of the metropolis, where she would perform her work, as well living a life so many could only dream of, dreams forged in blood. After so many decades of reveling in the screams and tears of those wretched and grotesque souls she would carve her blades into, one was delivered to her door that caused her to begin to question her calling for the very first time. It was the most beautiful thing she could have ever seen, which, in a land devoid of anything one would consider to be of beauty, that was no small thing. Being the professional that she was, she did not allow her momentary infatuation to distract her from her duties, cutting and carving into the flesh of this grotesque thing, just as she had done to every disgusting wretch that was ever unfortunate enough to lay upon one of her tables. It didn't take her long to realize that this one was more unlike the others than she had thought, as even the most grievous wounds her jagged blades inflicted did not even cause it to whimper. No matter what she did, this glorious thing would not break, not even a little. 
For years, she tormented this beautiful thing, tearing away pieces at a time, watching them regrow and slicing them apart once more, still not so much as succeeding in causing it to politely ask her to stop. And then, one day, it began to talk to her, not to make a plea, but to simply make conversation. It spoke to her as a friend, and not someone who had shredded it to pieces for so long. As time progressed, she began to return the sentiment, laying her blade down to converse with the things she was now tasked to torment. As the years bled together, she found herself looking forward to her appointments with this creature, no longer due to the fact she enjoyed her work, but because she could spend time with her first and only friend. It wasn't until the day she asked one simple question that had been on her mind for some time that she swore she would never take her blade to this thing again. What is your sin? she asked. Mine is the greatest sin of all, it replied, wearing a far more saddened expression than she had ever witnessed over her centuries of torturing the sinful. I betrayed my father. That simple answer inspired her to lay down her tools for good, never to turn them on another poor soul again. This, unfortunately, brought her content existence to an end, as her greatest talent was now a thing of the past. In choosing this single being over everything she had ever cared about, she began to lose all that she treasured, with the exception of what had become her obsession. When her friend rose to power, becoming the king of all the land around her, she was unable to follow, but he never forgot about her. One day, Many years after he claimed the throne, he found her once more, but she was far from the intimidating specimen of her younger years. Although the years had not been kind to her, he spent months nursing her back to health, before taking her with him on a more interesting appointment. They scaled mountains she had only dreamt of climbing before he led her through caverns she had never before seen and onto a pathway that she had never even heard spoken of in legend. After days on this quest, she finally witnessed a light brighter than anything she could have ever imagined, as the path had led them to something she could have never conjured, even in her wildest dreams. When she looked upon the glorious landscape that shimmered beyond the rippling portal, she wanted nothing more than to leap through to bask in its beauty. This is where we must part, he said, bringing her a pain she had never felt, breaching through her entire being. He promised he would see her again some day, but there was much work that had to be done before he could free himself from his prison. Learn all you can about them, he asked her, as she stepped through the gateway to another place. As she gazed back through the opening, she could see the sadness in his eyes and knew it mirrored her own. When the opening began to shrink to seal the two away from one another, he made one last parting request. Go forth and remember me, Lilith. It wasn't until she reached a bubbling stream that she became aware of how her appearance had changed. Whether it was the effect of this strange world or one last gift from the one she left behind, she did not know. But neither did she question it. She could not believe her eyes as her reflection revealed not a demonic beast of hell, but a beautiful, raven-haired enchantress. Humanity was still quite young, but she could not find her place amongst them. For decades she walked the land, never aging like those she was now surrounded by. As the centuries passed, she grew lonesome and distant. Not only was she unable to hold on to any relationship she formed, but she still longed for the company of the one she had left behind. She got bitter. She got angry. She regressed to the only constant she had ever known. The only thing she was good at. As her loneliness consumed her, and her sins against the people who felt like little more than ants to her began to mount up, she became more and more aware of a voice calling out to her. Allowing her heart to soar at the possibility that the friend who released her from hell may have finally come back for her, she followed the haunting voice until it brought her to the doors of a larger building than she had ever laid eyes upon. Inside the walls of that place, she found not who she was longing for, but a new and glorious purpose. In the open hall she found behind those doors, she found a book lying upon a simple table in the center of the room. 
The moment she touched it, she knew what it wanted of her, to bring its souls to feed upon. Though she had not freely admitted it, she secretly longed to be accepted back into the home she had been set free from so long ago. But with her new purpose, perhaps she could create her very own hell, one in which she would be the queen. As time passed by, she entered more and more names into her precious book. But when she came across a human who shared her lust for blood and power, she finally found a truly kindred spirit. The Orchid family came to know her as the Queen of Hell herself, though they had no reason to suspect otherwise, with the power she wielded and the riches she rewarded them with. Even with her new mission, as well as her mutually beneficial associates, she still felt insufferably lonesome. Though she had finally found her place in the world she was forced into, she still was without a true companion of her own. It was 1942 when her solitude would finally come to an end, or so she thought, when she saw him again. Though she looked far different to her unchanged eyes, she knew it was him the second their eyes met. The resentment she had grown for him practically melted away in that briefest of moments. For many years, he stayed by her side, though that time together revealed him not to be the same as he once was. While she had found her way back to the talents that defined her, his heart had grown softer, more tender, perhaps. Though neither of them was the same as they once were, they attempted to forge a life together on this plane. She walked away from her endeavors with the orchids and the mysterious building to share a life with the only thing she had ever truly loved. Unfortunately, their vastly altered outlook of the world and its people took its toll on their happiness, as she regressed once more to her only gifts. She tried to hide her passion from him, but he always had a knack for finding the truth of things. He scorned her for clinging on to the old traditions, claiming that he had found a better way. He was no longer angry with his father for casting him into the pits of the underworld, nor did he seek to punish his creation. She attempted to convince him that his initial beliefs about the horrid nature of these creatures were correct, but he would not hear it. We have to help them, he said, which only fueled her frustration with him, and when she would not back down, he gave her an ultimatum. Should she not cease her attempts to punish and torment those who walked the world beside her, he would be forced to stop her. She could barely believe her ears. Why would he have sent her to this earth if not to inflict the only talent she possessed upon its inhabitants? This being was the only thing she had ever truly cared for, but she would not allow him to leave her a shell of her former self. Not again. Regardless of her feelings for him, this was who she was what she lived for. Perhaps she was foolish to assume she would survive his wrath, even with how powerful she had grown. They had been discussing this while he drove her back to the apartment they shared in the city. When they pulled into the parking garage, she let herself out of the prized vehicle he treasured as soon as the wheels came to a halt. They had been discussing this while he drove her back to the apartment they shared in the city. When they pulled into the parking garage, she let herself out of the prized vehicle he treasured as soon as the wheels came to a halt. She stormed off, refusing to look back at him when he called out her name one last time. Before she reached the elevator, she turned back to see him still perched behind the steering wheel, gazing at her with wide and glassy eyes. The stabbing pain erupted in her heart as soon as she made the semi-conscious decision to outstretch her hand causing the vehicle and its occupants to be consumed in flames. She wasn't surprised when he walked unscathed from the wreckage, nor when he raised his own arm towards her. His clothes were still aflame, but she could still see the tears spilling down his face as he gave her one last chance to change her ways. Through her breaking heart and anguished thoughts, she screamed at him, promising only to bring more suffering to those he now sought to save before the brief and blinding agony shot through her entire being. As she fell into the darkness, she was certain her journey had come to an end, but she would be sorely mistaken about that. With her eyes reopened, she found herself in familiar surroundings. The first thing she saw was the softly pulsing, glistening black walls. 
She didn't even see the beautiful woman with the vibrant, scarlet hair until she lifted herself from the plush mattress she had been lying upon. The woman never introduced herself by name, only that she was a construct of the intelligence behind the house. Lilith and the woman with the shining red hair spoke for some time, with the former swearing she would not turn her back on the building again. With the aid of her new friend, she could consume a power unlike any she had ever known, as she fully gave herself to the energies within those blackened walls. This, as well as her relationship with the Orchid family, would allow Lilith to plan the revenge she longed for against the only creature she had ever truly loved, the one who had betrayed her. She knew he adored a mystery and would be unlikely to resist the opportunity to investigate. Of course, I couldn't resist having a little fun along the way. Could I, Lucifer? She just stared at Grant, while Orchid and I shared a similar, slack-jawed expression. So, wait, he is... Orchid stammered, suddenly realizing the truth behind the one he had thought to be the devil on his right shoulder. That's right, she said, still not breaking her gaze from her former lover. The old man got to his feet, signaling for his guards to open fire on the woman beside him. As soon as they raised their weapons, she flicked the wrist of both of her hands, inspiring the gunmen to train their barrels on each other. No, wait! The two called out before they opened fire. Frank and I both dropped to the floor, covering our heads, while the men drilled bullets into one another, not ceasing fire until the ammunition was spent. They slowly dropped to the carpet with a series of moist slapping sounds, as well as cracks of the bones which had shattered or split apart, grinding against one another on their descent to the floor. Orchid ran for the door to the left of where he had been sitting before another wrist flick from the woman in the red dress spun him to face her. What are you doing? He cried out as she pulled him back to her, as though she had cast an invisible fishing line. It's been a blast, honey, but I think it's time we see other people. She traced her fingers across the side of his pale and trembling face, and as the advanced years she had granted him began to melt away, revealing the true age of one who had looked so youthful only moments before, he fell back into his chair with his heavily wrinkled face and milky white eyes attempting to stare back up at her. She just stared down at the pitiful specimen before clenching her fists, causing the skull lined with thin and withered flesh to practically flatten as though it was between her fingers when she tightly balled them shut. The blood sprayed across the likely very expensive desk as the eyes popped and bones split through the skin before what remained of what was once a head planted down upon the blood-soaked wood. Alone at last, she said, as the room fell silent once more. So, Grant said, getting back to his feet. What now, Cutter? That's not my name anymore. Grant, is it? Call me Lilith. You gave yourself that name, love. I was always quite fond of Cutter. Sort of dressed up that story a bit, yeah? Not all of it. Not the part where you left me on my own for centuries. I climbed back to my feet, watching the two staring each other down. She looked at him with pure hatred in her expression, but her eyes betrayed her. Behind that slim wall of disgust, there was something so warm behind her gaze. Something I imagine maybe even she was not aware of. He regarded her with a far more somber and melancholy expression. Uh, given the fact that I was now the lone human in the room, I couldn't help but think she may make an example of me soon enough just to make a point. With that in mind, I remained a quiet spectator to their heated discussion rather than bringing unwanted attention to myself. So, with the legacy of the Orchid family having ended, Grant said, cutting his eyes to the body at the desk before gazing back at the woman in red. What's next? She just answered his question with a wide smile before walking softly towards the door on her right. Only moments after she pulled the door open, a familiar face strolled in from the next room over. 
a face with vibrant red hair hanging on each side of it, flowing over each shoulder. Though I had no doubt we would be seeing Ashley again, I was hoping we could deal with one problem before leaping headfirst into the next. Of course, it would seem both were hand in hand from the beginning, a fact that took far too long to sink through my thick skull. Are you ready to come home now, boys? She said with more arrogance in her tone than the emotionless voice we had heard multiple times before. Not so fast, hon, Cutter said, laying a hand on the redhead's arm. I thought I might give him something of an ultimatum. That's not what we agreed upon. He belongs with... Cool it, sweetheart. This is my rodeo now. She stared into Grant's eyes with that maniacal smile reaching across her face again while she strolled across the desk to look at him, face to face. No, he's mine. Ashley screamed, causing her hair to violently blow out to the sides and into the air above her head. In the court. Not yet. Cutter barked, spinning in place to glare at her. He's all yours when I'm done with him. With that, Ash settled back down, allowing her hair to obey the laws of gravity once more. So, Lucy, can you die? Cutter asked, tracing her fingers across his face. Everything dies, love. As the two spoke, Grant cut his eyes to meet mine, only for a second before turning back to the woman in red. In that briefest of moments, I felt my consciousness being thrust to somewhere else, where I found myself sitting in a room I couldn't quite make out. It was not dissimilar from how details were clouded in place between the bridge and the house I was still certain we would lose our lives in, though it felt far less malicious than the other place had. Seconds later, Grant appeared next to me. The haze faded, and I realized we were once more sitting together in the deserted bar he had left behind so long ago. Beer, Grant asked, suddenly sitting behind the counter again, though I hadn't noticed him moving. Of course, I knew these events were not truly taking place, but a beer did sound absolutely amazing. I gave a nod, still unable to quite convince my tongue to do its job, while absentmindedly accepting a cigarette along with my freshly poured draft. It's a lot to take in, I know, mate, he said, lighting up his smoke before handing me the lighter. What's happening, man? This place? Nah, this doesn't matter. What's important is what I have to say to you, and I'm sorry, mate. I'm so sorry, but it's not going to be easy to hear. Uh, just hang in there, yeah? Grant, we're going to be okay, right? Not this time, brother. I suspect this is the end of the road for us. Well, for me, anyway. No, you can't. I mean, surely... I tried to argue against what he was saying, but my mind couldn't translate my erratic thoughts into words, even if this was all in my head. Regardless of my frantic stuttering, Grant just laid his hand on my arm, giving me a look that was somewhere between compassion and understanding. It was enough to stick a fork in my argument and just let him speak. I still chugged down half of the imaginary beer while puffing away on my cigarette as if it was providing much-needed oxygen to lungs that had been lost to the sea. Real or not, the combination of the two convinced my racing heart to settle down a little. She's currently given me a choice, to surrender myself freely to the force behind the building, or to die right here and now. Uh, can't you fight her? I mean, you stopped her before, right? Surely you can... I can't. Not now. Not with the redhead nearby. She hadn't stripped me down completely, not like when we were in that damn place. But I can't hope to battle against Lilith like this. Not with how powerful she's grown. But surely she's not strong enough to kill you either, right? She has a weapon. One that's designed for that very thing. A blade forged from the Holy Grail itself. It's a god killer, mate. Even in my full strength. I'd be buggered if she was able to stick me with it. I felt my whole body sink, becoming more and more lifeless with every word he spoke. I couldn't bear the thought of losing him, 
but I also couldn't help but fear that this would be the end of me, too. Don't fret, mate. You'll make it out of this all right. I've already seen to that. You still have the key I gave you, right? I groped in my pockets to feel the small key still held within. I gave my friend a nod, unable to look into his eyes. The shame of my moment of fear about my own fate festered within me like cancer. She's holding the dagger to my heart right now, with as much she does not understand. I'm agreeing to her terms, with one simple addendum of my own. She's to release Brandon right away. Though I have agreed to accompany the two back to that building to surrender myself to its will, I will not be following through with that promise. His lips formed that all-too-familiar, mischievous grin. For a moment, I allowed the twinkle in his eye to release me from my self-pitying, but this was short-lived, when he confessed to me what he truly had planned. Okay, Brandon's been set free. I can feel it. It felt him re-enter the world. He is... Uh, yes, he's at your house, right where he was taken from. Alright, mate, here's the deal. As soon as we get back, you run to the closest door as quickly as you can. Slide the key in, turn it, and close it shut behind you. You get me? Yeah, uh, um, I got you, but do not look back. Grant, what are you planning? What does she not understand? He smiled again, giving me that almost frustrating look that just screams, I know something you don't know. There's something I never shared with her. A detail about our bond I never revealed. We are linked, she and I. Though I cared deeply for her, I never quite trusted her. So I put a failsafe in place for if she ever did choose to betray me. What? Basically, if she ends my life, she too will die. Of course, even if that were not the case, the death of an angel is no small thing, mate. I reckon it'll take out the both of them, as well as Orchid's little mansion. Might even seal off Arbison Bridge for good. No telling, really. It was almost frustrating how nonchalantly he was talking about his demise, as though it was nothing more than what he wanted for breakfast we were discussing. I still tried to fight against it, bargaining that there has to be another way. But he wouldn't hear it. Michael, it's okay, brother. If this works out, you and Brandon need never fear that sinister building again. I can't say how much this'll hurt it, but I'm sure it won't finish it off. Still, I see no reason why I would seek you and Brandon out once I'm gone. Grant, please. Mate, he said, once more laying his hand on my arms. This is our last conversation, my dearest friend. Don't let this goodbye be any more painful than it has to be. Yeah. My whole body was trembling and I stared into his quivering and glassy eyes. Though I knew I wasn't exactly in a real and tangible place at the time, I felt the tears streaming down my face as I wrapped my fingers across the back of his hand. Is there really no other way? I asked, barely holding myself together. Not this time, brother. He smiled far more sincerely than his normal, carefree, and mischievous smirk, before walking from behind the counter to face me one last time. Goodbye, Michael, he said, laying his hand on my shoulder. Goodbye, mate, I replied, attempting to smile back at him through the pain in my chest. Yeah, still sounds weird when you say it. He laughed inspiring me to follow suit, though there was no levity behind my hollow chuckles. I wrapped my arms around him, pulling him close to me. I felt him hold me tightly as I allowed the tears to flow as freely as they desired, now that my face was hidden from his view. This is it, mate. He spoke directly into my ear, causing that spike to ram deeper into my chest. Run, Michael. Run, and don't look back. As soon as the words left his lips, I found myself back in that elegant office, with Ashley glaring at me from behind the desk, and Lilith with the dagger held to Grant's chest. I wasn't prepared for how quickly it happened. I had only just become aware of the feet I stood on when my friend pushed his body forwards, impaling himself on the blade. 
right down to the hilt. Ash and Cutter both screamed out in a maddening wail that damn near made my stomach flip, leaving me almost frozen in place, terrified to move a muscle. Run, Michael. I heard him call out from the recesses of my cluttered mind, finally reminding me I was in control of my body. I sprinted to the door we had entered through, fumbling to slide the key into the lock. When I finally succeeded, I turned it, as well as the knob it protruded from. After I swung the door ajar, I betrayed my friend's final request, turning in place to look upon him this one last time. Every muscle in my body twitched as I watched the light breach from cracks that had formed across every inch of his flesh, while the entities who had brought us to this still shrieked in shared anguish. It wasn't their sounds that awakened the torment of my soul, but the agonizing scream coming from the mouth of my dearest friend. Go. He squealed in a matter that suggested his pain was reaching its climax. As I forced my trembling legs through the opening, I took one last glance at what I was leaving behind. I held the doorknob tightly as I stared on from the other side, pulling the key free from the knob before swinging it shut once and for all, the second the closest friend I ever had exploded from the inside out. The wails and shrieks fell silent as I dropped to the floor in front of the back door to the deserted cavern. My eyes still burned from the near blinding light that breached from within my friend, while the ringing in my ears from the devastating explosion I bore witness to for mere milliseconds would linger for some time after my sight cleared up. I know neither how long I sat upon the wooden floor of the empty bar, nor how long I cried out against the agony of losing Grant, but the pain in my chest would not let up, no matter how many tears I shed, no matter how loudly I screamed. Even when I allowed my anguished body to take a break from it all, I wouldn't arise from that spot on the floor until some time later, after the sun receded from the sky beyond the window, hiding my surroundings behind the curtain of night. It took a while for me to emerge from the bar to find my truck still parked out front. When I freed my phone from the center console to find the battery almost depleted, I saw that I had several missed calls from Brandon. He was far more aware of the bizarre events we had encountered this time, but I promised I would tell him everything when I got back home. Truthfully, I can't say if I had yet decided whether or not I would indeed tell him everything, but I knew I couldn't hide it all away from him anymore. If nothing else, he seems to have no memory of anything he had experienced after his girlfriends took him back to her place. I would think those to be memories best lost to potential brain fog. Though I was thrilled to hear he had indeed been returned to the world he belonged to, I was in no rush to return to my pleasant home by the beach just yet. I decided to rent a hotel room close to the bar for a few days, just to attempt to get my mind right before getting back on the road. Not only was I in desperate need of a shower and a change of clothes, but I hoped to just be secluded for a time. It wasn't until the third day after my arrival back in the real world that I felt compelled to return to the old pub my friend used to do business in. Given the fact that I possessed the key now, I assumed I could come and go as I pleased. When I walked into the otherwise vacant bar, I had to fight once more against the tears welling up. I had no doubt this would be a condition I may suffer from for quite some time, but I could only hope it would get easier with time. I ran my fingers across the surface of the counter as I strolled behind it to help myself to a refreshing draft, taking a seat on that same bar stool and lighting up a smoke after it was poured. I puffed away while continuing my battle against my burning eyes as I reflected on the good times Grant and I had shared. Even when we faced the most horrific things, we still found reasons to laugh in the face of it. It wasn't until I allowed myself to share a chuckle with the visual image of my friend's goofy grin that I became aware of the strange glow emanating from somewhere behind me. I slowly spun the stool I was propped on to see the back door that led to so many strange and unusual places having swung open, with a bright aura flowing from another place beyond the one I sat in. 
Being somewhat unsure what to make of it, I just glanced at the entrance to somewhere else, still sipping on my refreshing pint. Once both my beverage and my smoke reached their end, I had already decided to walk through the opening in the rear wall. I groped in my pocket again to assure myself that the key my friend entrusted me with still remained before I passed through into the unknown. Though I was well aware that this could be a trap, possibly set in motion by the very entities Grant had hoped to put an end to, I somehow knew this place to be one I should not fear. I could sense that it meant me no harm, if that makes sense. Once my eyes adjusted to the light, I realized I was standing on a long pier that overlooked a gorgeous beach, with the shimmering ocean in the distance. As I glanced from one side to the other, I could see not the slightest trace of anyone else around, with the exception of a lone individual at the end of the pier. As I paced towards the man, the sounds of the waves crashing against the wooden support beams sent my mind back to the home I shared with my friend and business partner. Though I had no idea of the identity of the man I approached, not what his intentions with me may be, I couldn't help but allow a smile to reach across my lips. The ocean breeze drifted through my hair more vigorously as I neared the guy who I could now see was fishing over the railing, and I found myself growing more and more curious about what was going on here. Hello, Michael, he said in a worn but pleasant voice. Um, hello? I replied, unsure of what else to say. Suppose you might be wondering what's going on here, huh? He said, in an accent that sounded somewhere between country and Cajun, to my less than worldly ears, anyway. It crossed my mind, I replied, as I stopped beside the stranger. Now that I could fully take in the man I shared the pier with, he looked to be maybe in his late fifties or early sixties. He was about the same height as me, with thick and wavy white and grey hair being tousled by the wind, a thick moustache that almost hung to his lower lip, and dark skin that looked to have spent a lot of time under the very sun that shone down upon us. He looked as though he was in a pretty solid physical shape, with his muscled arms bulging beneath the rolled-up sleeves of his blue and white striped shirt, which was unbuttoned about halfway down his chest. He stood barefoot on the wooden planks with military green shorts hanging just below his knees. He reminded me of several of our regular customers at the bar back home, that laid-back attitude of enjoying retirement and living the good life for a while. For a moment, I even considered he very well be exactly that, but there was no evidence to support that theory, other than the fact he apparently enjoyed life at the beach. So what's next for you, kid? He asked, reeling in his fishing line. What's your plans from here on out? Um, I'm not sure. I was somewhat unsure of what he was referring to, but given the fact I was leading him through the back door of my late friend's bar, I had to believe it had to do with Grant. Hmm, he replied, holding out the bare hook before casting it out into the ocean once more. Uh, Lilith might be out of the picture, but Bill's still there. That bother you at all? I mean, yeah, but what can I do? I said, more speaking aloud my inner frustration than addressing the stranger before me. I'm just a person, just some random asshole. I don't have any powers, I wouldn't stand a chance against this place. Hell, even Grant almost died there, and he was... I know who Grant was, and there ain't no such thing as just a person. I never met no one who wasn't unique in one way or another. His voice was deep, but friendly. Time-worn and scratchy, but warm and somehow comforting. All I'm asking is, is what would you be willing to do if there was a way to free yourself and Brandon from that place, once and for all? I, I mean, I suppose I'll do whatever I could, but... What if I were to tell you you might even be able to get your buddy Grant back? I was dumbfounded, lost for words by what he was saying. Uh, yes, I knew that sinister building still held on to a part of me, but was he really suggesting that Grant could still be alive? His body, uh, well, the shell he was wearing, was destroyed by a weapon of immense power, the man said, while idly tugging his fishing pole. 
In essence, yeah, Lucifer fell that day. But not all of him. And not completely, anyway. I still couldn't find the words to make any of this fully register. I just stared at the man as he casually talked about the things that were well above my understanding. Now you see, if you were hit by a truck tomorrow, your body might die, but your soul will be split between what comes next for you and what's left in that place. Uh, pretty much what your friend's experiencing now. Of course, unlike how this had worked for you, where your soul would still move on a little less than what it was, but mostly unaware of what's missing, is very different from what an angel would go through. I wanted to ask questions regarding every single little thing he said, but I could already feel my pulse quickening from the implications of his words. A short story long, if you was able to put an end to that place, not only would you rebuild your own sort of broken soul, but you might could restore your friends, too. Could he really come back? Like, be whole again? Not completely at first, not the same as he was before, but an angel can restore itself if even a particle remains, even one who has long since fallen. He made a very strange expression as he spoke those words. There was something almost melancholy behind his eyes, but there was something else, too. The smile he wore seemed like he was hiding a secret behind it, but I could very well have been reading too much into it. I could only vaguely make out his lips behind that thick mustache as it was. Regardless of my lack of fully understanding all of what he told me, even the slightest glimmer of hope of bringing Grant home was enough for me to have made my mind up before I even knew I had. Though I had so many more questions, I pushed those to the side for the time being. Only one thing needed to be asked. What do I have to do? Ain't rightly sure just yet. He said, reeling up his fishing line again, grimacing when looking upon the still vacant hook. Still a work in progress, so to speak. Just had to be sure he was interested in lending a hand one last time. He gave me that strange smile again, raising one eyebrow higher than the other. I could tell there was so much he wasn't telling me, but I was certain I wasn't remotely capable of understanding most of what he may be hiding. There was still one question that felt as though it would burn me up from the inside out if I didn't ask. Who are you? Just think of me as an invested third party, he replied with a chuckle. But, like, what is all of this to you? I don't mean any disrespect or anything, but what's your role in all of this? I almost felt like an asshole for suddenly feeling compelled to practically interrogate this guy but I just knew he was hiding something from me. Even if it was something that was far above my pay grade or ability to even conceive, I needed to know more if I was going to just blindly put my faith into some stranger who had no luck with fish. He just studied me for a moment, leaning his fishing pole against the railing while propping one elbow on the ledge. The look in his bright green eyes damn near convinced me he had more than just a work in progress worked out already but that only frustrated me more. It felt as though he was dangling the possibility of getting Grant back in front of me, just like he hoped to convince some absent-minded fish to latch onto his bait. That building is a stain, kid. A damned blemish on an otherwise beautiful landscape. I've come to understand it's been around for far longer than maybe even I have, and it ain't no small thing. He began to gaze off while he spoke, drinking in the gorgeous scenery that surrounded us. More folks it swallowed up, the fatter and more powerful it's growing. Suppose I didn't ever pay it no mind when it was small, you know? All kinds of nasty things out there, son. I can't wipe them all away. But this one's gone too far. Gotten too big for its britches, though I don't suppose it's got no reason to wear nothing like that. Hell, it may well swallow the whole world if we don't put an end to it soon. How the hell can I even hope to put something like that to an end? I asked, suddenly feeling my brief moment of hope sinking to the pit of my stomach. I almost jumped when the man lay a weathered hand on my shoulder, but the twinkle in his eye almost reminded me of the look Grant would get when he was up to something. Everything has a weakness, kid. You ain't got no idea what you're capable of, son. 
But you will be soon enough. You give me some time to come up with something. I'll be in touch. He clapped me on the shoulder before recommending I return to my home for the time being. Yes, I was eager to get to work, even if I was fully unprepared for the task at hand, but just the glimmer of hope his words had provided me with was just enough for now. Regardless of when uh, whatever the strange man has in store for me would come to fruition, I followed his recommendation and returned to my home by the beach. I felt more exhilarated than I realized I would be when Brandon met me at the front door. Well, where the front door used to be, anyway. Our house had returned to the way it was before Ashley transformed it into a scale replica of the place she came from, but the gaping hole from where Grant had made a new exit was still there. Brandon had placed a tarp over it for the time being and had already made some arrangements to have it repaired, but not everything can get fixed overnight, I suppose. Though we still have a lot to talk about, it feels so good to have at least one of my closest friends by my side again. I don't know where the next chapter in my story will find me, but I most certainly have my hopes for how it'll all turn out. I can't say whether or not we have a chance of succeeding, but perhaps all is not lost. Not yet, anyway. I'm still unsure of the identity of the man on the pier. I have some theories, but nothing I'm willing to think out loud. I do believe he's here to help, though. Of course, that doesn't mean I'm about to let my guard down. Not until I'm sure he can be trusted. Again, I thank you for hearing me out on one more long-winded tale, and I hope I have wonderful news to greet you with at our next meeting, should there be one. There is still a dark cloud looming overhead, my friends. Now perhaps I will manage to brave the oncoming storm and see the light on the other side of it, but if not, should you never hear from me again, please know I went down fighting, just as Grant did. Whichever way my story ends, for better or worse, I may see you again, brother.